sage in that group. You should have seen it. Okay. What do you all feel? The physical meetings will take over the webinars or the webinars will continue to stand? I'm sorry to interrupt. We are live. Okay, okay, okay. I'll take that question then. Um, a very good evening to one and all of you, uh, dear uh, expert panel and speakers in this very interesting session which we have put together. It's about the most tricky moments in glaucoma surgery and the way forward. And I truly, truly hope that we have a good attendance uh, because I'm sure there's going to be so much more learning. I'll, I'm looking forward to the next two and a half hours packed with learning, thanks to the, the cream of glaucomatologists on the, this session today. We are very lucky to have with us joining soon Dr. Craig Chaya, who's an internationally renowned glaucomatologist. And uh, he practices anterior segment ophthalmology with a focus on medical and surgical management of routine and complex cataracts and glaucoma from Moran Eye uh, Center, University of Utah, Salt Lake City. And we look forward to hearing from them, from him. We are truly lucky to have with us Dr. Tanush Dada, who is another doyen of uh, ophthalmology, uh, most leading glaucomatologist of the country from RP Center of Ophthalmic Sciences. And we're sure going to learn a lot from him. Joining us soon would be Dr. Krishna Das, who's again, uh, director uh, uh, HRD and uh, in the Advent Eye Care Systems, again, a very leading glaucomatologist of the country, located at Arvind Eye Hospitals from Madurai. With us, we are lucky to have with us Dr. Harsh Kumar, who heads the glaucoma services of the CFS group of hospitals based at New Delhi. And I'm sure he's going to give his pearls of wisdom. With us is Dr. Shishmita Koshik. Don't ask me how, but she seeing her on the screen itself gives us one big bout of energy and uh, she's the professor in the department of ophthalmology pgi changdigar and i'm sure you all of us would agree heartily with me towards the end of the webinar and moderating with me is dr mulidhar i've just no words to describe the kind of commitment he shows be it glaucoma pediatric and neuro -ophthal. and i'm sure he would add his own views and points towards this webinar we wouldn't be going on in the sequence because Dr. Craig Chaya would be joining us a bit later. And I see Dr. Sisha has not joined. So taking us on next is Dr. Gauri Murthy. And again, she's a senior consultant and heads the glaucoma in Prabha Eye Clinic. And again, a person with such practical thinking that she literally would feed the contents into our mouth and brain. And she's going to talk to us but a very important topic, management of bleb dysthesia, a video presentation, and which should open up discussions. On to you, Dr. Gauri. Thank you so much, Dr. Chitra. I thank the AIOS ARC for this opportunity. So what is dysesthesia? Is the Oxford uh, Dictionary says that dysesthesia is uh, just an unpleasant sensation, an abnormal and unpleasant sensation. So many a time it so happens that you are happy with the outcome. The IOP is less, it's 8 or 9 or 10, and the vision is maintained, but the patient is very unhappy. Many of the times it is because of a bleb like this. So this kind of a bleb produces a lot of unpleasant symptoms for the patient, which we term as dysesthesia. So when is this common? When you have a very markedly elevated bleb, if the elevation is uh, uh, too much and this bleb cornea angle, the angle between the bleb and the cornea when it is acute. So then also the bleb becomes very, very symptomatic. The bleb can also extend onto the cornea like you see in this picture. And when you have an acute bleb cornea angle, it leads to bubble formation when the patient blinks. And also the surfacing of the cornea here just next to the bleb suffers and you may have Delen formation. So this is not a very happy situation for the patient, definitely, even if you feel that the IOP is well controlled. Study and exposed and internasal, I mean, nasal blebs and interpalpebral blebs, blebs also are known to be more symptomatic. So according to a publication by Budenz et al., 
younger age, superior nasal blood, blood blockation, poor lid coverage, and bubble formation are associated with higher incidence of filtering blood dysesthesia. So how do we manage a patient with a dysesthetic bleb? The first line of management, if the dysesthesia is not much, would be conservative. So you can give aggressive lubricants and also topical NSAIDs. You can also try pressure patching in the earlier post-operative period and an oversized bandage contact lenses, lens of 18 millimeter diameter all these uh, result in certain amount of scarring of the bleb or limitation of the bleb. And sometimes you can get away, but most often than not, the most dysesthetic blebs need intervention. So the challenge is that you have to revise the bleb, but maintain the IOP control. You can't lose the IOP control. So what are the options for surgical management? Certain less invasive options are autologous blood injection, you can take the patient's own blood in a 2cc syringe and inject it subconjunctivally into the bleb. The mediators and the inflammatory mediators promote scarring and the bleb can become a little less elevated. But even here, the outcome is not predictable. Palmberg ad uh, advocated what we call compression sutures, where you put sutures across the bleb and compress the bleb. And this is also said to be successful in limiting the bleb and uh, lessening the size of the bleb. But many of the times we will need to go for surgery of a bleb revision or a bleb uh, uh, you know, uh, reduction surgery. So let us look at a few methods in which it can be done. This uh, conjunctival advancement can be done where you have small elevated blebs. So this is uh, the principle is very similar to the Palmberg suture, but here you excise the conjunctiva and you bring it down you make a linear groove in the cornea and you bring down the conjunctiva over the bleb and suture it. So it is like a compression uh, uh, method only, but then what happens is that the intact conjunctiva comes down, the thin conjunctiva is covered with that and the cutting and the suturing all promote a little scarring and this can result in the flattening of the bleb. So this is one way of managing it surgically. And the other way is to completely excise the bleb. So many a times these uh, dysesthetic elevated bleb are also associated with overfiltration. So as you can see here, there is a ring of steel which has made the bleb very, very localized and very thin and elevated. So what I'm doing is to excise the bleb completely. So once I excise the bleb, I see that there is a area which has melted in the sclera. And this has to be addressed. If you don't address this, again, you will have a problem if you just advance or you do a conjunctival graft. So what I'm doing is to rotate a, a flap of sclera. I'm taking a partial thickness scleral flap from the uh, nasal side. I'm rotating it onto the thin area. And then I am suturing it so that this sclera acts as a flap would do. So it allows the filtration to become more guarded. So the neck, uh, melting of the sclera had made this almost like a full thickness procedure. So you can see that I'm placing the sutures away from the flap. I'm taking a X sort of a suture, which compresses that area and decreases the filtration to a certain extent. Once this is done, if we can bring down the conjunctiva onto the uh, limbus, we can pull the conjunctiva down and then we can suture. So this also results in a lesser uh, uh, symptomatic bleb. So the next method, which I will uh, show you, is uh, a, 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 a procedure where we have used conjunctival autograft. So here you can see the bleb is dissected into the cornea. So in such cases where there is extreme dissection of the bleb into the cornea, you need to use a tunneling uh, blade, a crescent blade, and then go into the plane between the bleb and the cornea, it comes off very easily. And you can excise that portion. If it is just a corneal dissection, you can even excise this and the bleb may not leak at all. Here I have excised the complete uh, bleb and I've taken conjunctiva from the inferior fornix and then I'm suturing it uh, in a postage stamped manner to the area where the previous dysesthetic bleb was. So once I have sutured it uh, meticulously, 
I also cover the defect inferiorly. And this also results in quite uh, satisfactory uh, outcomes. So you need to choose different techniques based on the, uh, the particular patient. And you can see that uh, you can have outcomes which are very satisfactory. So you can see this particular patient who had a very dysesthetic bleb, he ended up having a quite uh, posterior and diffuse bleb. So these are the ways in which one would manage a dysesthetic bleb. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Gauri. There were wonderful uh, videos which you showed us now. Um, after you have excised the bleb, um, how would you check for leak? That's a very simple question I'm asking. After I excise the bleb. Yeah. yeah. After you excise the bleb, you have the bed where there is filtration. So yeah. if, if you put sterile fluorescein, you will see that there will be some seepage. But then yeah. if there is a frank necrosis, like I showed in the second case that I... Uh, demonstrated, there you will have to reinforce either by a scleral patch graft or a rotation scleral graft like I showed you. But uh, I also would like to re-emphasize that many of these dysesthetic blebs do have leaks in them yeah. because they are so elevated and so thin. So preoperatively also you should do a sedal and it's not just enough to watch that for a few seconds. Sometimes the leak is apparent after a few seconds are done or when you press on the eye. So one should meticulously look for a leak and in the presence of a leak, that is always a risk factor for endophthalmitis and that tilts you towards surgically revising the bleb, especially if it is a late onset leak. Uh, Dr. Tanuj, this uh, uh, often intervening here, the bleb actually fails if it was actually functioning the way it was. So would you then uh, treat for the symptoms or would you just treat if it is actually that it's got very hypertonous and when you feel there are minute leaks that you would treat it? How, what would be your criteria of management? So uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Chitra. And uh, thank you, Dr. Gauri has covered very nicely the techniques. So I just like to add the first principle is regarding prevention, how to prevent this from occurring in the first place. So I think the key is to use diffuse area of mitomycin C posteriorly and not just put one or two swaps of mitomycin C at 12 o'clock, that is what leads to localized bleb. Number two is that whenever you are constructing your trabectectomy flap, you should not dissect very anterior, the scheral flap, because that area leaks anteriorly and that leads to these blebs over the cornea. So the stop dissection at least two millimeters from the limbus and then you can use Kelly's punch to make the ostium that leads to posterior filtration. Now, once you get bleb dysesthesia, majority of the patients you can manage with conservative therapy, like use some gel eye drops and massage and patient may be comfortable. Once the there is some drop in visual acuity or the bleb is on the cornea and that leads to astigmatism. So then you have to intervene. So there are two situations. One is either there is a cosmetic issue or there is astigmatism or there is a large symptomatic blip, but it is still functional. In, so in that situation, best technique is to either use compression sutures, either you can use vertical or vertical plus horizontal compression sutures, and that will take away the decrease the height of the blip, induce fibrosis, and patient may be comfortable. Number two situation, when the blip is on the cornea, so you should put a demarcating 10-0 suture on the, between the cornea and the posterior limbus. So, and then you just dissect off the part of bleb on the cornea. That way you do not injure the draining bleb. And you can get away just by the simple excision. Now, second scenario is when you have overhanging bleb, bleb dysthesia with some abnormal function like hypotony. Once you have hypotony, then you have to take care of the conjunctival epithelial barrier that has to be reinforced. And Dr. Chit uh, uh, Gauri very nicely showed, you have to do conjunctival advancement with overlay in that situation. 99% that will work. If there is a scleral necrosis, you should image preoperatively ASOCT or UBM and check your scleral necrosis and plan for a scleral patch graft or a Mormonese repair. And that is very rarely, most of, most of the cases you can do with conjunctival advancement. One last tip, if the bleb height is very high, before doing the compression, you can do posterior needling. 
to decrease the height of the blab and have the actors go posteriorly. So those are some thoughts and long term surveillance is required because once you intervene with the blab, there is chance that later on blab may fail. So you may have to escalate medical therapy. So patient has to be on long term follow up because these can also recur. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Harsh, you have something to add? Yeah, <clears throat> Chitra, so uh, thank you for having me here. And yes, uh, wonderful videos <clears throat> as usual by Gauri. One important thing is that <clears throat> whenever you're doing a uh, conjunctival advancement, because these are this is for the routine ophthalmologist, because it's not a difficult thing at all. So we can all excise and bring it forward the very important thing is that once you're bringing it forward, it should lie there, just lie there. If you're tying it, I have, I have seen it n number of times, if we tighten it, and then it will retract invariably, whatever number of sutures you pass over there. So always give a relaxing incision a little posteriorly beyond the bleb, which may not be going through the entire conjunctiva, but at least the superficial areas. And uh, make it a curvilinear uh, this thing, relaxing incision so that now your conjunctiva is just lying over there and yeah. then just you are tying over there. Otherwise, they tend to retract. Second thing is, if the blebs are uh, elevated but nothing else is wrong, you know, and they can themselves give this as like Gauri rightly pointed out, especially if they're acute and all. So we had published a technique way back in 90s in which you can paint the bleb with gentian violet and use large laser spots like that you use in gonioplasties. 500, uh, you can use 300 to 500 milliwatt and 500 micron spot size uh, argon laser spots, which can actually char down the whole thing and make it much more palatable for the patient. And somehow the other pa patients are able to. So before we go into any surgical, this thing, one can always try this laser thing, which may work only in 10% of the cases, but then you are not going into a uh, surgical procedure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Murli, you have anything to ask or shall I go on to the next speaker? Any important point to add? Murli? Murli, are you there? You have to unmute yourself. Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm unmuted, ma'am. Um, so... I had a question um, for the panel. That is, uh, what about using cryotherapy for these um, huge blebs? I mean, does it work? One, and second, if the conjunctiva does go back, uh, then what are your options? Like, uh, you sutured the conjunctiva down, uh, and the conjunctiva does go back. Then what are your options? If I may answer, cryotherapy is very destructive. So you are aiming to preserve the bleb function while you are uh, handling the dysesthesia. So. I would not think that cryotherapy would be a um, you know preferred option. Second, when you're doing conjunctival advancement, like uh, Dr. Harsh rightly mentioned just now, if the conjunctiva is under very you know significant traction, it is going to retract back. So you will have to give side cuts and you have to mobilize the conjunctiva so that it comes over and then it is correctly sitting and the limbal suture should be secure. But even despite that, if it retracts and you have exposure, then you have no other option but do an excision and an either an autograft, I mean, if from the lower fornix taking conjunctiva or even amniotic membrane you can use if there is uh, not much conjunctiva. Thank you very much, Dr. Gauri. Do stay with us. We need you for the panel discussions. And we shall now go on to our next young dynamic speaker, Dr. Devang Angmo, who is Assistant Professor of Ophthalmology for Biocuma, Strabismology uh, and Neuroophthalmology Services at RP Center. And she is going to tell us about early bleb leaks. On to you. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for the kind introduction. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me. And I will be speaking on management of early bleb leak. So if you, uh, in the first, in the early post-operative period, what we look for after doing a trabeclectomy is to check for the IOP and look at the anterior chamber depth. And we have to rule out uh, a leaking bleb by doing a Siegel's test. So this is the first thing that we look for. So early bleb leaks are not uncommon. The leaks, they, uh, the incidence ranges between 0 to 30%, depending on the, uh, more so with the fornix based flaps versus the limbal based flaps. And we always have to do a Siegel's test uh, or or as pressure seals to look for a leak 
to note the wound gape or uh, any button holding and also we should know the risk factors for uh, for these um, these uh, uh, early leaks usually these the patients are usually high myopics or patients having connective tissue disorders or patients of extreme ages old ages who have thin flimsy conjunctiva who are uh, likely to have these uh, defects so along with these leaks what is common is that we have uh, some grade of shallow shallow anterior chamber so the anterior chamber depth should also be noted along with the leaking blebs so if you look on to a working um, uh, management of the early bleb leak is that if the leak on the cedals is uh, if the defect is uh, less than 1 mm and on cedals the leak is not profuse uh, then we should go firstly we should go ahead uh, do a conservative management wherein we have a uh, medical management we have pressure bandage and we re rarely do use um, uh, glue and if the defects are more than 1 mm we should go ahead and do a surgical uh, repair so if you look at the management in the medical management the first thing that we should do is to taper the steroids which uh, which will enhance the fibrosis we can also use pressure patching or pressure bandage a large diameter uh, bandage contact lens and eicosuppressants like topical uh, beta blockers which will uh, depress the eicos circulation and enhance the fibrosis so this was a patient who had a early uh, uh, pinpoint leak as we can note at the arrow where there was a, a suture tract leak so in this patient we uh, managed the patient by a conservative management and we also gave a oral uh, tablet doxycycline which also enhances the um, conjunctival epithelialization and within a week the, this uh, suture tract leak healed on its own and the uh, anterior chamber was maintained you can also do a pressure patching which classically uh, they use two uh, two bandages for the press pressure patching and this also uh, works very well in the early post operative period in uh, the large uh, diameter co bandage contact lenses uh, especially can be used if it is a limbal based flaps and uh, where the uh, defect small defect is at the limbus where it cannot be sutured and it works wonderfully in these patients however on the other side if you, we see a profuse leak and the defect is more than 1 mm uh, these beds are unlikely to uh, 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 heal on its own and a surgical repair is uh, more so required and uh, along with that ac repair may or may not be required so during a surgical repair uh, these patients we pref prefer uh, uh, to do it under a peribulbar block however these eyes may be severely hypotenuse and therefore subtenon uh, uh, lignocaine can be given on table and we avoid toothed forceps we avoid cutting needles and uh, preferably uh, do a good exposure of the bleb using corneal traction sutures and even after even after uh, all these conservative management our bleb does not uh, 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 the leak does not stop or the bleb doesn't heal uh, we should always do a wound exploration so this was a case in which there was a, a, a persistent leak and we were managing it for uh, with conservative management for a week however when we did a bleb exploration we could see that there was a gap at the temporal side of the wound and the uh, uh, the wound margin was ragged and it was it had extended anteriorly which was leading to a persistent leak here and we had to suture the flap and thereafter we had to uh, do a watertight closure of the conjunctiva using a round body tapered needle uh, with ato vicryl on the other hand if the uh, if there's a large defect uh, which is more than 1 mm uh, we can either do a conjunctival ad advancement or a conjunctival patch graft or a scleral patch graft with conjunctival advancement the videos i think would be overlapping as with that of dr gauri and uh, in the interest of time i would just like to su summarize that uh, for early bleb leaks uh, after doing a cedals we should first check for the defect if it is on the smaller side less than 1 mm we should do a conservative management however if the if the defect is on the larger side a surgical uh, repair is required thank you for the patient listening thank you dr devang that was a very crisp uh, talk which seemed to cover everything but something very basic uh, which the audience would want to know too is how do you avoid uh, suture related uh, suture tract leaks uh, uh, dr sushmita Uh, sorry what uh, how do we avoid suture tract created leaks 
Uh, one thing is when you, especially doing cutting table flaps, I think it's important to use a round body needle because the width of the needle is equivalent to or slightly more than the width of the suture. Whereas if you use a tapered point, then uh, there would be a suture leak and a track form. But having said that, since we are, most of us are doing phonics based flaps now, yeah. so we do need tapered needles but it's important to include the episclera when we are suturing conjunctiva especially if you're doing wing sutures but the but in case you're doing a frill suture and you're doing conjunctiva to conjunctiva i think uh, having a eight to round body is important rather than that that's the most important thing now if if the leak is uh, a little beyond the limbus wherein the contact lens may not uh, work so that means in those areas we are left with the uh, a surgical uh, repair only, I suppose. Yes, if the contact lens, even even if the leak is within the area of the contact lens, we generally give a conservative treatment for just two three days. And another thing to do is we can give aqueous suppressants to reduce the aqueous production for that period of time, so that there is no aqueous being produced when uh, the leak is healing. That is one. But uh, if not, I mean, it, it's foolhardy to wait if you've seen a leak. And you haven't repaired it, so you really want to go and uh, uh, you know, repair it as soon as possible. Uh, anybody in the panel have any question to ask? Or Murli, you have anything which you should cover? Uh, yeah, I would like to ask the panel, if you uh, opt for a large diameter contact lens, then uh, how long would you keep the contact lens in uh, place? And uh, when would you like, rem uh, like to remove, if the anterior chamber has deepened? And uh, so when would you like to remove the contact lens and see check again for the leak? So we usually use an extended use of contact lens, which can be in place for at least 48 hours. So we would do that, allow time for it to heal before even attempting. There's no point removing it immediately. But uh, sometimes the 16 mm contact lenses are very difficult to acquire. You may not get it offhand. Um, the tip about pressure bandage is that we do not keep the pressure bandage on if the patient is asleep. So our instructions are that do not have the pressure bandage on when you're sleeping because then with the bells you're actually compressing the center of the cornea and all of that is gone so we tell them that if you're feeling very sleepy just take off the pressure bandage at sleep but have it on throughout the day and very small leaks and if the pressure is still uh, i mean if the chamber is still about grade two and still not flat um, they might just heal with steroids atropine and a pressure patch you don't even need to in a contact lens. Yes. So what is the time you typically check for the leak? Uh, I mean, uh, do you check on the first post-operative day or the ninth day when it, uh, it is set to peak? And how long do you keep checking for the leak? Uh, no, does the uh, blood morphology have anything to do with it or do we do it routinely in all patients for the first three weeks? No, there has to be a reason to check for a leak. I mean, yeah. there has to be a hypotony, flat or uh, shallow AC and a flat bleb. That would be the most important. So if I can obviously see an overfiltering bleb with a shallow AC, I know that there's not leaking. So the bleb morphology would. So routinely we would. But yes, if you have a disesthetic bleb, if there's hypotony, and if the AC is shallow with a bleb which is not so well formed, those are the red headings that those patients should do a leak check. Very true. I think that uh, completes it. So we shall now go on to our next speaker. Uh, Dr. Sirisha has joined, I see. So uh, I would just like to briefly introduce her. She heads the Glockma services at uh, LV Prasad Institute uh, based at Hyderabad. And she's an, another amazing glockmatologist of our country. And uh, she is going to be talking on a very challenging topic, management of glaucoma post Capro. On to you, Dr. Sirisha. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, uh, Dr. Chitra, for the invitation. Uh, my video is there. I would like to yes, play uh, the video. Yes, 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 doctor. Yeah. Hello friends, I'm going to be speaking to you about glaucoma and keratoprosthesis in the next few since Keratoprosthesis refers to artificial cornea which is developed to treat end-stage corneal diseases and this is not new, it's been there since 1850s. However, the problem was that these eyes uh, suffered from poor retention rates 
and it's only in the later half of the 20th century with better designs and improved surgical technique uh, and decreased infection rates, the improved uh, retention rates is something that we see today. So type 1 keratoprosthesis referred to a type of keratoprosthesis which is uh, similar to that of a uh, corneal transplant where the central part of it uh, is an artificial cylinder which is sutured onto the eye similar to that of a uh, keratop keratoplasty. So what are the anatomical retention rates that we see in our country? We know that in our country being the tropical climate with the infection rates being very high, the retention rates are definitely less than what we see in the West. So it's as close to as 70% is what we see. And uh, in the West, the retention rates are very good, 93 to 90, 95%. Because these uh, retention rates have improved, or rather the keratoprosthesis is, is retained for a longer time, glaucoma is a major blinding complication in these eyes. We evaluated the glaucoma in patients with type 1 Boston and orokeratoprosthesis in Indian cohort, and we found that close to about 61% of them had a glaucoma, and majority of them actually required surgery for control of intraocular pressure, either prior to keratoprosthesis or after it. Not just the incidence of uh, glaucoma is high in these eyes, as high as sometimes 90%, but also the progression rates are very high. So I'll take you through a case. This was a boy who was 14 year old presented to us following a cracker injury. You see the kind of severe ocular surface problem that he has. He underwent multiple procedures and over the next five years and 14 surgeries later, and the last one being keratoprosthesis, his vision improved to 2050. Uh, the interesting thing was his cup disc ratio was normal and his visual fields were also significantly fine. In the next 10 months, his glaucoma worsened despite medical treatment as the uh, CD ratio increased to 0.9 and had an advanced glaucomatous damage. So this boy underwent an Ahmed glaucoma valve implantation and following which his intraocular pressures were managed uh, with additional medications and visual fields were uh, maintained at that level over the next eight years. So why does this happen? We know that for glaucoma diagnosis, intraocular pressure assessment, optic nerve head and visual field assessment are very important and intraocular pressure is what is monitored while treating them. In patients with keratoprosthesis, prior to surgery because these eyes have scarred corneas to record intraocular pressure or to evaluate the disc becomes a challenge. Post-surgery, evaluating intraocular pressure in these eyes with artificial cornea is again a big problem because none of the currently available tonometers can actually record intraocular pressure over the artificial cornea. So what we rely on is a digital uh, tonometry, which is highly subjective and we know that it is not very useful. Uh, so with this uh, question in mind, we uh, would wanted to test if a sclera can be used to record the intraocular pressure in these eyes. So we did an experiment uh, uh, which was published in 2019 where we, of the different tonometers that we used, we found that the Shiot tonometer when recorded, recorded the intraocular pressure on the temporal sclera gave us intraocular pressures which were almost close to the GAT intraocular pressure readings. Uh, and uh, the range of agreement uh, between the GAT and the scleral, GAT intraocular pressure and the scleral uh, uh, Shiot stonometry readings were very close. We used that information uh, on the type 1 keratoprosthesis patients, and uh, it was very interesting to build a training model from the uh, data set that we got on, in the normal eyes and used to predict the GAT intraocular pressure readings from the scleral uh, tonometry readings that we got with the Shear stonometer. And the uh, predicted GAT was evaluated. So this predicted GAT, like I said, the difference between the actual GAT and the predicted GAT in the normal eyes that we found was less than one millimeters of mercury, the difference. And this one also gave a very close reading. Since the uh, conventional method of testing intraocular pressure in these eyes is finger tension assessment, we also saw between an expert checking the fin finger tension tonometry and the uh, scleral Shiot tonometer, uh, which was converted to a, a predicted GAT, we found that the accuracy was as high as 91%. So based on our research, we now use finger tension tonometry and scleral Shiot measurements to monitor intraocular pressure in these eyes. Angle assessment becomes very difficult. Sometimes ASOCT can be helpful to understand what's happening to the angle. And angle closure is a major 
uh, problem in these eyes. Disk evaluation is definitely possible uh, when the media clarity allows. Functional assessment, especially if the visual acuity is maintained well, is very, very useful uh, because it can actually give you about 60 degree visual field assessment. A serial assessment is helpful to pick up the uh, progression of the disease and that will also help us to uh, treat these patients appropriately. So how do we treat glaucoma in these eyes? Topical medications, we do use, start them in fact prophylactically, but what we do not understand is what is the efficacy, especially with its penetration through the artificial cornea. To a great extent, oral carbonic anhydrase inhibitors are very useful if the patient is able to tolerate. Glaucoma drainage devices, especially the valve devices are very useful in these patients. If the conjunctiva is very poor and one cannot perform a, a GDD, then endocyclopotocoagulation is definitely a choice or a transcleral cyclopotocoagulation. So in the presence of pre-existing glaucoma, and if we are planning to do a keratoprosthesis, we prefer to do a GDD prior to doing a keratoprosthesis. And that is definitely helpful if some amount of corneal clarity is present. However, if the cornea is very hazy, then we do a simultaneous K-Pro along with a GDD. In situations where a post uh, K-Pro glaucoma is diagnosed and then a GDD is performed later and based on how the conjunctiva is, one has to choose a smaller or a larger device to be able to uh, hold in these card conjunctivas. So our protocol in managing these patients with K-Pro is very strict where we do a two to three monthly assessment of intraocular pressure with the digital as well as the short stonometer, we do visual fields every two to three monthly whenever they come for a contact lens change and prophylactically start them on anti-glaucoma medications. And whenever there is a slightest of doubt that either they have developed a glaucoma or the glauco existing glaucoma is progressing, uh, they do undergo a, a valved glaucoma drainage device surgery and are closely followed up post-operatively. So to summarize, keratoprosthesis is definitely a boon in helping this patient see, especially with severe corneal bli uh, blindness. Glaucoma is a serious complication in the long term in these patients. Uh, monitoring and diagnosing glaucoma in these patients becomes very challenging because of the way the IOP is assessed as well as the disc and visual field assessment is concerned. Early and aggressive treatment, both medically and surgically, is something that one needs to be um, thinking of. And GDDs are very useful in these patients. Uh, unlike what we do with our regular glaucoma patients, very close and long-term follow-up is required for these patients. And visual fields, like I said, assess need to be assessed every two to three monthly. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Sisha, for uh, making it uh, apparently simple the way you discussed it. But uh, do we, when you said you start them prophylactically on anti-glaucoma medication, so based on your IOP measurements, which are anyway quite gross, would you want to go to the maximum medical treatment before you look at surgical intervention? Because even your field assessment in those patients with limited vision is not uh, going to be possible, even though you did mention two to three months, uh, th once in three months doing a fields and all that. So if the vision is limited, uh, when would you take a call? You have to do GDD. Again, the conjunctiva might also be quite limited. Dr. Sirisha? Yeah. So thanks, uh, Yeah, thanks, Chitra, for that question. So we do start with medical treatment and uh, topical medications are given. But the question is, how well do these topical medications work for them? Mm -hmm. So we give them uh, topical medications and I specifically try and also add oral anti-glaucoma medications for them. And when I say close follow-up, we do many. In fact, when you when I showed the data, uh, this is a question that the reviewers also asked. Why is it that you don't do a GDD in every patient? GDDs yeah. are not without complications in these eyes. You only yeah. do it when, there is, when they are necessary. So medically, we manage them. Majority of them, we can take care of them medically. Borderline pressures and visual fields. Is, if the vision is all right, we can definitely do a visual fields in them. It's never a problem. So medical management and if digitally IOP is not getting controlled or uh, with the, or with the shiots, we know so with the shiots, anything that is recorded beyond 14 millimeters with the shiots, uh, to me it is high intraocular pressure. Plus, since we do it uh, serially, we know how the pressures were, were prior. So that also is something that we take a. Uh, 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 take consideration of. That means the progressive increase in pressure or uh, 
IOP that is greater than 14, or if the visual field is showing a progression, then we take it up for an implant surgery. Again, we need to remember valved implants is something that we do in the, uh, not, not something that you would, you know, the complications is not something that you will uh, access. So we need to remember that. So doing a surgery is it's very simple, but then the problems that are associated with them and post-operative follow-up. Yes. Still is a challenge. Dr. Shushmita, you want to add anything? Mostly so want medical to... management, if yeah. not, then only surgery. Yes, yes. Yes, Dr. Srisha. Dr. Shushmita, would you want to add any quick point on this? And Murli, any question before we move on? Srisha's exactly. covered, yes, yes. covered most of it. There's nothing yes. much to add. It's very interesting yes. that Ultimately, yeah. it is our fingers and our clinical yeah. acumen that help us with all the gadgetry that we have. But I think yeah. very well. Putri probably has the maximum experience from all of us. So yeah. thanks, Alicia, for that lovely presentation. Yeah. Only? Um, Madam, where exactly would you position the tube? Like the anterior uh, segment is totally deformed. Uh, so would you position it uh, in the anterior chamber or do you do a pass planar? Uh, that is question number one for the type 1 keratoprosthesis. Thank you. Uh, for the type 2 keratoprosthesis, there's hardly any conjunctival cover. So, uh, I mean, uh, and uh, even cyclophotocoagulation, um, cyclophotocoagulation or cyclocryotherapy may not be possible because the uh, sclera is covered by such a thick mucous membrane for the, in the type 2 keratoprosthesis. So, uh, what would... Yeah, so I think uh, they're very important questions. So, I would divide them into two parts. One is type 1 keratoprosthesis, we need to remember, have very high incidence of uh, glaucoma. So, type 2 keratoprosthesis, fortunately, since you remove the majority of the things, including the anterior, uh, the cornea, the iris, and vitrectomy is also performed in them, the chances of glaucoma in them is far less. So in a type 1 keratoprosthesis, all the problems related to a keratoplasty are there because we haven't really removed everything and removing posterior capsule. So although these eyes are left fake, posterior capsule is something we leave them intact because to prevent the posterior segment complications, again, we have shown that removal of the capsule uh, is not a good idea unless it is an fake patient to begin with. So majority of them, I think the location would be a sulcus placement as far as I'm concerned. If it is a completely vitrectomized eye, then obviously pars plana or sulcus, it really doesn't matter because you know the location is somewhere uh, two to three millimeters behind the limbus. So that's what we will do. Uh, if, if it is a type two character processes and your tissue uh, orientation is very difficult, what we do is measure nine millimeters from the center of the cornea. And that, that is likely to be the area because if you say I divide uh, uh, 12 into half, 12 if you say is the Y to Y in an adult, half of it is six, add three to it is about nine millimeters. And that would be the approximate area where your pars plana is located. So that's the area where you enter. But even if you want to locate, uh, you know, that is the location for your uh, pars plana if you have to do an intraocular procedure or a pars plicata if you have to go maybe one millimeter anterior to that, we can do a TSCPC. But prefer, I would prefer to do an endocpc in these eyes. Okay. okay. Shall we go on to our next speaker? I think that was an amazing uh, amount of information we got. Our next speaker is Dr. Roni George and he's the Deputy Director of uh, Shankar Netralia uh, Chennai. And again, a uh, very prolific glaucomatologist who's been a teacher for many. So let's hear from him on managing a failing bleb two weeks post-op. So uh, thank you for the kind invitation, uh, Dr. Chitra. So I'm going to basically try and cover these things. So which are the things that I would look for about two to three weeks post-op as signs of fibrosis? One would be a shallow bleb, vascularization or increasing IOP. And I would also try to identify which is the site of fibrosis which is leading to bleb failure, whether it's subconjunctival or subtenance, whether it's subscleral or whether it's a block at the ostium. So, and it's important that you assess everything in the, in the bleb, the height, extent, vascularity, the intraocular pressure, and also very importantly, the feel. It's important to assess what the bleb feels like. Also, uh, make sure that your ostium is open because sometimes all that you have, uh, all the problem that you have is a little blood clot here. You massage a little bit and it will open up and there's nothing more needs to be done. So when I told you that in addition to assessing bed morphology, please massage it. And when you massage it, you need to figure out does the bleb increase? 
how easily does it increase and till what extent does it increase? So this is a case, uh, first case is about five to six days post-op. The anterior chamber is deep. The baseline IOP is 32. IOP now is eight millimeters and there's a shallow blip with minimum vascularization. So now what's going through my mind is, is this may be a component of ciliary body hyposecretion, which you can get early post-op. So I do a gentle massage. And this is what you will see on massage. So what you can see is when I'm massaging there, the bleb does come up on your left side. You'll see a sudden bleb there. And you can also see the fluid leaking from there. So one of the commonest causes for an early uh, bleb failure or early fibrosis is a bleb leak. Because when you have a bleb leak, your cornea will, your conjunctiva will flatten out and you will get subconjunctival fibrosis. So any shallow bleb with an IOP, which is you know, unusually low, you should rule this out. And Dr. Devang has, clear, has uh, demonstrated well as to what we need to look at there. So this second patient is about five to 10, uh, about five days post-op again, AC is deep, IOPs are 14. The bleb is fairly flat and vascularized. IOPs are still 14. Here you have to make sure that your, your, your ostium is patent and we do a gentle massage. And what you can see with the gentle massage here is that the bleb is forming up fairly easily, not as suddenly as in the other patient, but you can see that it is expanding over there. So here the, the level of fibrosis is subscleral and you need to start 5-FU injections right now because if you can manage to tide over this, this period, then you may not even need to release a releasable and you can continue to have a good bleb. Now, this next patient over here, sorry. So this next patient is a retrap. And what you're seeing over here is essentially, this is a previous trap. And this is a fairly vascularized bleb at about two weeks post-op. There is a significant elevation, but the intraocular come down with difficulty. So what can you do over here? The releasable is already released. You're trying to massage and just watch how much difficulty I have with the massage. So here you have significant subconjunctival fibrosis. And if you leave this without managing to get an elevated bleb there, your, this uh, surgery is going to fail. So here you will need to do an organ laser suture lysis in order to try and cut the remaining apical suture and start injection 5-FU. Again, daily follow-up and make sure you continue to massage. And this is what happened after the suture lysis. You can see a nice web come up there. And the patient is actually doing, did fairly well with, and this is after about three, five, if you still. This fourth case is 15 days post-op. The anterior chamber is deep. Intraocular pressures are 34 millimeters of mercury with a flat blip. And now here I'm going to massage and I'm going to just show you what is happening. So here with the massage, with, I'm not really feeling a blip. I'm having to do a lot of massage there. And you can sort of see a little bleb forming. I continue to struggle with the massage. Then I decide that instead of doing a direct massage, I'll do an indirect massage. And with the indirect massage, you can see that the bleb is actually formed a little better. So what this tells you now is there is some flow through the scleral, subscleral space you are getting some amount of, uh, you're managing to build up the conjunctiva, but it's difficult. And here you need to either consider one of two things, either needling or home massage. You teach the patient how to do home massage, do daily follow-up, give repeat injections. If the patient is not, uh, cannot come for follow-up regularly, you need to consider needling. And this is another situation where you have somebody, this is a little longer than that, maybe 30, 35 days post-op. You have a nice elevated blip, IOPs of 34. It's insisted. And then what you would need to do is basically, again, the same thing that is needling. And I'll just share with you this uh, short video on needling. And this is basically not one of these two patients, but this is a patient with subconjunctival sub fibrosis, just like the first case. You can do this at the slit lamp or in the operation theater. And what you're doing here is using side-to-side -side movements to sort of free the adhesions that are there. And you can see the blood starting to form. I'm sorry, that video is. And you can see the blood starting to form now with the needling. You can see the elevation over here, close to the needle. And then after that, you go ahead and give an injection 5FU a little away from the blood. 
you may need to form the anterior chamber, which is why this is safer to do in the operation theater than in your outpatient, especially if you'll end up with a sudden overfiltration. So post-op blood management, early fibrosis is a tailored approach. You require a good rapport with the patient because of you're doing all these things for the patient. The patient needs to be aware of what they can expect post-op. And I think it's important that you, sorry, this is, I think I have 30 seconds. I'll just show you the agonizer suture lysis video. I wasn't sure I'd have time to do that. So this is basically a, man, um, a mandricon lens that you're using. You can also use the edge of a four meter gonioscope if you want. Under topical anesthesia, you place the lens over the bleb and you basically, if you have massaged enough, you just require to be one shot and you can see that that suture has opened up. So essentially, you need to titrate your response to bleb fibrosis based on the level, the duration of fibrosis and what sort of follow-up you can do. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much. That was uh, so methodically explained. A uh, very basic question I'm going to ask you. When would you start advising a home massage? At what time? Would you wait for two weeks uh, before you start or you do it earlier? And can you just explain how the home massage should be done to the patient? Okay. So the, the two components to it. Now, if you look at the patient that I showed you, I had to struggle a fair bit to get that blep going. And in a patient like this, whether if it, as long as I've ensured that there is no block at the ostium, I would even advise early massage, maybe seven to 10 days. If on the other hand, the bleb is forming very easily, or I'm worried that there is a block there, then I would not advise, advise home massage because a very vigorous massage can end up with a shallow anterior chamber. And the first time the massage would be in the outpatient. I would make the massage, I would see what is happening. I would probably ask him to wait for a while and repeat it again. How you massage, there are, I think, multiple techniques. What I want to do is the indirect massage where with the patient looking up, I ask them to massage steadily for a count of about 10 seconds, and then do three sets. I prefer not to ask them to do direct massage, which is adjacent to the bleb, because when you give an oblique massage to the area of the trabecle, of the um, flap, you can suddenly land up with a shallow AC. And if you are really, really rough, you can even cause a conjunctival dehiscence. Yes. Uh, Dr. Harsh, Dr. Shushmita, would you all also advise that indirect massage or do you feel sometimes only the direct massage will help in some cases? So uh, I agree Siddha, with Dr. Muni. Yeah. I think uh, he is, uh, Ronnie has really wonderfully yes. covered every point. Yes. <clears throat> but uh, like he rightly said, I first made him uh, do it over there. Yes. To see if the direct, if the lower uh, lid massage is actually not elevating it enough, which happens sometimes. Yes. Then I'll tell them to look down and away and then do the massage at the yeah. <laughs> lateral quadrant of the uh, uh, lid with yes. patient looking down, press, yes. release, press, release and yes. see it every single thing that, okay, one press release, how much is the pressure? Yeah. Another press release, how much is the pressure? Yes. And, and, and that really works wonders. And I, I really, because I just acquired an eye care and it is so beautiful to have a rebound tonometer because then you can actually you can't do the applanation all the time and see how what exactly is the pressure and NCT is so unreliable in these cases. Yes, yes. So you have to yes. see which one is working well and then make them sit like, like Ronnie said, if after an hour, check how much the pressure is elevated. So you yes. can even titrate that after how much time he's going to do the massage. Yes, I agree. Would you prefer uh, Phi FU or uh, MMC, uh, Dr. Shishmita, when you decide to do uh, needling in these patients? So we've always uh, used 5FU rather than that. But then like Ronnie said, you have to first identify yeah. where the block is and then plan. Because yeah. uh, of course, UBM is the best thing to do. But we've also uh, learned clinically to look at the ostium. And what we've seen is if it's flat, it's, it's just a small slit then it's likely that there's subscleral fibrosis and not much fluid is going out into the subscleral space. Then doing a subtenons usually doesn't work. The subtenons works when the ostium is fish-mouthed. So if you see these fish-mouthed osteums and you do a UBM, you see subscleral fluid very well. So that's an indirect clinical thing that we've seen. But whenever we do a subtenons and we do it on the slit lamp, then I use 5FU away from the bleb directed away from the blip and then massage throughout. But 
I'm a little wary of using MMC in the outpatient, which is a little uncontrolled, so I use my opinion. Um, Dr. Tanu, do you have anything to add here? Dr. Krishna Das, a very warm welcome. Read your thoughts on it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chitra and others. Uh, very good evening. Uh, actually, all the stepwise procedures Ronnie has covered well. And uh, only I would uh, differ with Sushmita, Sushmita that uh, most of the patients we see uh, when they end up with uh, subconjunctival fibrosis, um, they already have uh, uh, significant glaucoma and require very low target pressures. And uh, earlier I used to do 5FU, but uh, now routinely I use uh, mitomycin for all my blood needling. And it's a good point. Most of these needling respond very well only when there is subconjunctal fibrosis. If the fibrosis is uh, subscleral, most often it is episcleral rather than subscleral. There is a sheet of fibrous tissue that actually is uh, on the surface of the sclera and it doesn't respond to uh, routine blood needling. In this case, what I do is uh, I try to enter the anterior chamber with the needle blindly. And uh, 50 to 60 percent of the time it works, and rest of the time we have to uh, adhere to stepped-up medical therapy or uh, additional surgical procedures, uh, depending upon the response of the intraocular pressure. Dr. Tanuj, that was uh, very useful, Dr. Krishna Das. I think very excellent lecture by Dr. Roni, yeah. and I think just two additional points. One is that uh, I would always prefer indirect lower lid massage because. With the patient, you are never sure of how he does and there can be more complications. Mm -hmm. Secondly, whenever we do needling, I don't do it at sit lamp. I take the patient to the operation theater because sometimes you can get shallowing of the AC and then you are very badly stuck. And thirdly, like if you are massaging and there is no elevation of the blip, that means there is definite subscleral fibrosis. Then I would do what Dr. Krishna Das also mentioned that it's like an ab internal needling. You have to go from inside the anterior chamber and go to the ostium and try to open the cleft or disengage the fibrosis. And that may lead to the fluid coming out into the blood space. So sometimes you may even combine ab internal with the ab external to get a clear picture. Having said that, the rate of blood needling in literature, failure rate is very high. So 60 to 70 percent may fail over next two to three years. So you have to warn the patient that there is high risk of failure and later on you may require to do a revision trabeclectomy. Thank you. Yes, very useful points. I think it was a great learning in this talk. So we shall now go to our next speaker, Dr. Sati Devi, who is again a, a senior consultant glaucoma uh, from Nara Netralia. Again, a very great uh, glaucomatologist in uh, nationally and she is going to be talking on management of lay blood leaks. On to you Dr. Sati. A very good evening. Um, today I will be talking on the management of late blood leaks. I, at the outset I would like to thank Dr. Chitra and uh, the team, the ARC team for giving me this opportunity. So, uh, when we have a patient who is uh, who has well controlled pressure post trap, and he presents to us with something like this, a leak, definitely that does not make us happy. He may present with blurred vision, shallow anterior chamber, hyperemic disc due to hypotony, choroidal detachment, and retinochoroidal folds due to maculopathy. This is end of the is something that we definitely need to avoid. Conservative management includes aqueous suppression, pressure patching, contact lenses, and use of blue or laser to seal the leak. Surgical management includes the use of amniotic membrane, here a bandaged contact lens, large diameter is being placed, autologous blood injection may be tried, compression sutures can be tried, however, blood revision is the more definitive surgery. In this patient here, you can see a scleral melt, an area of scleral melt, and the overlying conjunctiva shows an area of brisk leak. 
So here we start off by excising the epithelium on the surface of the bleb. So it is not really necessary to remove the entire bleb or excise the entire bleb. We just need to create an area of raw surface which allows better healing. So the epithelium is being carefully removed and you can notice the ring of steel all around. I am now making a nick in the peripheral cornea and trying to create a raw area for the conjunctiva to be anchored at the limbus later on during surgery. I like to do this before the eye becomes hypotonus. Sometimes they can be leak of actinus and the eye can become soft. Now I start near the area of thick conjunctiva near the area of the ring of steel and try to release this unhealthy conjunctiva. We need to excise this thickened conjunctiva which is not very healthy and also we need to release the additions below the conjunctiva so it is easy for us to pull this tissue down mobilize it so that we can advance it towards the limbus so the thickened conjunctiva and is being excised and i now create a partial thickness scleral flap because of the area of necrosis and covering it with a patch graft this is anchored in place by bites which are taken on either side of the patch graft i'm using tenomonofilament nylon and it's important to take these bites through healthy conjunctiva uh, healthy sclera you cannot pass it through areas where the sclera is necrosed once this is done I try to mobilize the connectiva. You can see it is a little difficult. So I now make relaxing incisions in the connectiva, in the periphery, in the fornix. So this allows us to mobilize the connectiva further. Now take two wing sutures and you're anchoring the connectiva to the limbus using the tenor monofilament nylon single suture. And I then bury the knot so that it is comfortable for the patient. A similar suture is now taken on the other side and anchored to at the limbus. The rest of the connectiva is also sutured. Here I am placing mattress or box sutures and anchoring the conjunctiva. So as you can see the conjunctiva is not very close to the edge of the uh, peripheral cornea where I had created the raw area, but it really does not matter. It is important that you don't uh, stretch the conjunctiva too much uh, while anchoring it. This will definitely heal. Now the two vertical arms of the conjunctival edge are now sutured. I'm using Vicryl, Atovicryl continuous interlocking suture. The suturing can be done using any uh, suture that the surgeon is comfortable with, just making sure that there is watertight closure. Once this is done, the superior uh, traction suture is removed, ensure that there is no leak and we are done with the surgery. Now this is another patient, you can see a small area in one corner of the plate where you have a thin cystic area and you can see the leak from that area. So again I am excising the bleb, and you can now notice here there is an area where there is excessive leak of aqueous. So I just go in, you can see the gush of aqueous. So I just take a single bite through that area this seems to be the upper edge of the scleral flap and I'm putting one single teno interrupted suture to reduce the excessive flow that is happening through this area. I don't need a patch craft here. Now I just cover that up with the healthy conjunctiva and close. So if the pleb is large, the excess pleb, one may need to put a conjunctival water tap. I would like to conclude by saying that late pleb leaks are not infrequent they may be associated with vision threatening complications. Conservative management may be tried. Surgical revision is definitive. Technique needs to be tailored. Results are good, but a small percentage may lose IOP control. 
and eventually required to be put on medications. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Sati, that was again a wonderful video presentation. Uh, very good. Uh, good evening, Dr. Craig. Nice to see you have joined us. Um, Dr. Tanuj, I would want to ask you, what are those, which are those patients whom you would choose for a bleb sparing epithelial exchange? So um, I think um, uh, Dr. Sati has very nicely yes. explained. And sure. once yeah. you get a once you get a late bleb leak, yes. that is related to mitomycin C toxicity because the conjunctival epithelial barrier is disrupted. So majority of the cases, you will have to do a surgical revision with the epithelial exchange and conjunctival advancement. Now, if the, there is a serial defect obvious on a state lamp evaluation, as Dr. Sati showed, then you have to plan for eye bank sclera or if the defect is small, you can do a Momini's repair with rotation of the lateral sclera. And sometimes with very small defects, we have also used collagen implants to plug the defect for very small defects. If you have available UBM or ASOCT, then you can do preoperative imaging and that may help you to delineate the area of scleral defect and plan preoperatively. But in general, late bleb leaks, majority of them will just uh, be repaired with conjunctival advancement. And lastly, long-term follow-up because you have injured the bleb, there may be excessive fibrosis and over time the IOP may rise. So you have to counsel the patient to come for long-term follow-up. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Murli, you have a question to ask? Um, yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, this autologous blood injection into the bleb, uh, I mean, any of you have any experience in uh, doing that for uh, late uh, bleb leaks? And uh, one more question for Dr. Tanush that uh, he um, actually injected ologen into a, a thin bleb through a side pocket. So in which condition would you use that? And uh, uh, I mean, what is the success rate of it? Through a cartridge, I think you had injected a ologen into a thin wall bleb. So what is the indication of that procedure? And um, so, Murli, uh, thank you for your question. So, first is that I'm, I really don't advocate blood for late bleb leaks because there the conjunctival epithelial barrier has is disrupted and you have to put in a new conjunctival epithelium. So, just injecting bleb, bleb, the blood won't do for late bleb leak. Second is ologen. We have stopped using as a replacement to mitomycin C for trabeclectomy. So, we no longer use so, but if you don't have eye bank sera available and you're not confident in doing the mominis repair and if the scale defect is small, then you can plug that defect with ologen and apply sutures over it. So it promotes vascularization and it, it can help to close the defect. Plus you have to do a conjunctival overlay. What you were mentioning about uh, the uh, injection through a, we used a, like IOL insertion cartridge. So that is because sometimes when you do the bleb repair and you use clera, and there is a very high risk when you do so much of dissection that other way around your bleb is going to fail and you're going to get high fibrosis. And there you can't use any antifibrotics because you're dealing with hypotony or already the mitomycin C is the cause for failure. So there, sometimes we have used ologen to, to purpose is that it will, it will plug any micro defect in the sclera in addition to your serial graft. And secondly, it will have some sort of spacer effect between the conjunctiva and the sclera to prevent initial fibrosis. Because if you get a lot of dissection fibrosis, then the pressure, patient may have very high intraocular pressure after sclerial reinforcement and conjunctival re reinforcement. But that is for rare cases. I would not, not recommend routinely to use Ologen implants for bleb repair. Just conjunctival advancement will solve the problem for most of the cases. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Tanuj. Uh, we shall go on to our uh, Dr. Craig. Uh, Dr. Shushmita, you want to add something? Yeah, yeah. Just one small uh, thing that when we use scleral patch grafts, we've actually started using releasable sutures on the posterior end. So when the uh, invariably the pressure does rise, like Dr. Tanuj said rightly. So we have something to keep, to really, you know, take it out and then the flow keeps going posteriorly. So that's something that we start. Um, uh, shall we take your talk, Dr. Craig? 
I have introduced sure. you already, so I'm not repeating the grand introduction. Are you able to hear me okay? Yes, you will be talking on minimizing the learning curve for glaucoma drainage devices. Yeah. Okay, great. Let me share my screen here. Yes. Okay, great. You're able to see my slide there? Yes. Now, I'm looking at the panelists here, and all of you are very senior surgeons here, so I hope this is somewhat applicable to most of you that are doing some training, and I hope that there is a uh, web audience that uh, is learning how to do glaucoma drainage devices. Uh, I'm going to mainly focus on a, a newer technique, though, but some of the steps that I'll be covering are, are important for whether this is your first time placing a glaucoma drainage device or whether it is you are a very experienced surgeon. Okay, I have some financial disclosures, but none that are relevant towards this talk. And we have an array of options that are available to, to us now to implant glaucoma drainage devices. Uh, we have the Bearvelt, the Audi, Multino 3, the Paul glaucoma implant, and then the Ahmed glaucoma valve, and the Ahmed clear path. Mm -hmm. Of all these options, the Ahmed glaucoma valve is our only is the only valved option that we currently have. All of the other options that you see on the screen here are what we call non-valve devices, and all of them need to be flow restricted early on in order to promote formation of the blood capsule. So we'll discuss that in a little bit more detail. So as many of you are familiar, there are multiple implantation steps. I'll just quickly go through this. Normally I place a traction suture for better exposure of the superior conjunctiva or whether I'm placing a inferior plate, I'll be placing that traction suture along the inferior limbus. A conjunctival pridomy, and there are several options in how you perform a conjunctival pridomy. It can be performed typically with a limbal incision with relaxing incisions, or in the video that I'll be showing you is an envelope technique. It's important to identify the rectus muscles, whether you are using a device that needs to be placed under the rectus muscles. Securing the plate, tying the ligature and checking for absence of flow, trimming the tube to the appropriate length, and the insertion of the tube in the AC, sulcus, or pars plana. Securing the tube, finally placing the patch graft, if that is something you choose to do, and finally the conjunctival and tenons closure. So these are general steps for any glaucoma drainage device. Complications after glaucoma drainage device surgery. Here you can see this list, it looks quite daunting. And I know for many of you that are placing this for the first time, when you look at this list, this could be enough for you to dissuade you uh, to perform a glaucoma drainage device. However, I would like to look at these complications and group them into these four main categories, hypotony, strabismus, conjunctival erosions, either the tube or the plate itself, or hyphema. Now, if we look at hypotony, the reason we want to avoid hypotony is to avoid this series of complications, cataracts from tube lens touch, corneal edema from tube corneal touch, choroidal effusions, and suprachoroidal hemorrhages. So if we can think about them as, our t as we approach glaucoma drain device surgery, as we approach our, our, our tactics to avoid hypotony, our, our whole point is to reduce this series of complications. Strabismus, this is why it's important to use an appropriate size device and to appropriately place the device. If there are portions of the plate that need to be placed under the muscles, those should be done appropriately. And it's important to make sure that the plate is not overriding the muscle insertion. Uh, in some cases, you may have the option to place this supratenons and, and to avoid um, having to, or uh, avoid potential trauma to the muscle insertion. However, even with a subtenons placement, or intratenons placement of the plate, strabismus can occur just from the mass effect of the lead. Conjunctival erosions is our next series of complications that we're trying to avoid, primarily because we want to reduce the risk for endophthalmitis. And finally, hyphema. Hyphema is typically more prominent when we're placing a tube in the sulcus space, but can occur in the anterior chamber as well if we were to tear the iris root. 
So these are some key steps that I want to highlight for the novice glaucoma drainage device surgeon. Number one, it's important to learn how to tie a proper tube ligature. I typically use 7-0 vicryl suture, which is dissolving suture, will, which will dissolve in approximately six weeks. You can also place a ripcord or a stent suture within the tube itself before tying the ligature around. And I think this is very helpful for novice glaucoma drainage device surgeons because it's easier to tighten and adjust uh, the tension over the ripcord stent suture. It's important to learn how to identify rectus muscles. So this skill set is something that you would have with your squint surgery. So it's very important to be able to use a muscle hook in order to uh, identify the true insertion of each muscle. Sometimes as you place the muscle hook, you may actually split the fibers of the muscle body or muscle belly. So it's important to really learn how to reach posterior and then bring the muscle hook anterior to find the entire uh, rectus muscle. Next would be the conjunctival tenons closure. I recommend a two-layer closure of closing the tenons first uh, with just a few tack down sutures and then using a running suture to close your conjunctival. This will prevent the tenons from retracting, uh, which can lead to a weak bleb wall and also could promote a tenon cyst, a large tenon cyst over the plate. Finally, tunneling the tube I think is critically important to avoid um, to avoid conjunctival erosions later. And if you're placing the tube superiorly, it's important to avoid the friction zones between 10 o'clock or at 10 o'clock and the two o'clock regions. This is where we have a lot of palp palpebral lid friction onto the ocular surface. So it's important to avoid this area if possible. Sometimes that may not be an option if you have a prior bleb in that area and you are placing a glaucoma drainage device in the setting of prior scar tissue. So these are the key steps. I'd like to now just spend the time uh, going over this video and I'll point out a few nuances of this surgical video. Here we are using a corneal traction suture, a 7-0 vicryl suture. And then we're approximately four to five millimeters posterior to the limbus. We'll be making a parallel incision to create an envelope capsulotomy. And in this technique, I'll be using a clear path glaucoma drainage device. This is lidocaine with epinephrine in order to facilitate blunt dissection. This is a caw conjunctival clamp that is used to secure both layers of the conjunctiva and the tenons. Now we'll be using a Blumenthal dissector, and this is a nice dissector that can be used to spread the tissues and to dissect posteriorly without having to uh, tear the conjunctival protomy open. Here I'm actually using mitomycin. I'm injecting 0.2 mLs of mitomycin posteriorly along with two pledgets, uh, which we'll leave there for two minutes. Now, this is in the setting of a patient who already had a prior Zen, which is difficult to see in this picture, but just nasal towards this site is a scarred down Zen bleb. So because of the history of rapid scarring and encapsulation for Zen, we'd opted to use mitomycin. BSS is then used to copiously irrigate the pocket. And some of you may be wondering, wow, that is a small protomy, and I'm, this is on purpose. And this is order, in order to minimize trauma to the area and to reduce scarring. This is the clear path drainage device. Again, we're using the 7-0 vicryl suture in order to tie a ligature. And it's difficult to see in this photograph, but I'm using a clear ripcord suture. So typically you may be used to either a nylon or proline suture, uh, but this is a clear uh, ripcord suture, which is difficult to see in this photograph or this video. Here we're now using BSS on a cannula, a 27G cannula to test the ligature. And here we have complete occlusion. We'll then complete the ligature with securing knots. Those will be trimmed. And then in this next portion, you'll see that we'll be able, to, because this clear path silicone plate is very flexible, uh, we're going to fold the clear path plate in half. And that'll allow me to place this in this small envelope. So we'll fold it manually, then grab it with forceps, and then place it through our conjunctival perineal opening. Again, the conjunctival clamp is very helpful to secure the two layers of tissue to prevent retraction of the tenons. Then a cyclodiaso spatula is used to unfold the plate while it is inside the pocket. It unfolds nicely. And then approximately seven to eight millimeters back from the limbus, we'll make some marks here to secure 
the plate. We'll use 80 nylon here in order to secure this to the plate. I think it's also appropriate to be able to use Vicryl to save costs on suturing. Uh, my only uh, critique with using Vicryl when you're close to working to tenons is it tends to get snared in the tenons tissue. So this is one of my trainees performing this surgery. So we're using nylon for ease. Uh, it's very slick and prevents any, any entrapment with tenons layer. We're securing the second eyelid here. The nice thing about the clear path plate here, uh, similar to the bare belt and the Audi is that the holes for securing the plate are fairly anterior to help promote ease. This is the last suture. We'll then secure this with a 2-1-1 suture technique. After the plate is secured, we'll then start to focus our attention on the tube placement. This is a patient who has a history of RK uh, with a somewhat compromised corneal already who is pseudophagic, pseudophagic. So my approach here is to actually place the tube in the sulcus location. We'll rotate these sutures into the eyelet holes. And because we're going to place this tube in the sulcus space, I will be entering two millimeters back from the limbus. I will also try to tunnel for approximately two, mil two millimeters through the sclera before entering through the sulcus. Calipers are used to mark the region. We'll then use Westcott scissors to dissect forward under this conjunctival skirt. And we won't do too aggressive of a dissection in order to help hold the patch graft in later. So that's two millimeters back and then two more millimeters back. So that most posterior mark is four millimeters back from the limbus. This is the clear rip cord suture. I'm using 5-0 proline here. We'll use the Blumenthal conjunctival dissector again, just to create a lateral pocket in order to facilitate placement of the rip cord suture. Suture is then placed under the tenon's tissue exiting externally in near the inferior fornix. And then we'll trim this later. You'll see I'll use low temp cautery just to blunt the tip in order to prevent any exposure issues. Here we're using the 7-0 vital needle as a spatulated needle in order to create a wick. I like having a wick for early pressure control. So this is passed in front anterior to the ligature. The 7 vicryl needle then will be used to create one fenestration. Some people use multiple fenestrations. I found that more than one with the wick tends to create some early hypotony. The tube will be trimmed with a side bevel configuration. A side port will be created in order to inject viscoelastic to enlarge the sulcus space and to reduce the risk for iris ciliary trauma. I'm using a cohesive viscoelastic here for space maintenance, and it also helps to remove it easily when I'm using a cohesive viscoelastic. We'll bend the 23 gauge needle, and then tunneling two millimeters before entering into the sulca space. We'll go nice and slow and easy. Well, you can then see the needle emerge just under the iris. And a slight enlargement of the external opening facilitates placement of the tube. So as you withdraw the 23 gauge needle, it's recommended to just slightly enlarge the external portion of the tract. Then we'll place the tube inside and confirm its placement in the proper location. I've trimmed out some of the video, but we've cut the tube multiple times because our first placement, we felt like the tube was a little too long. And so we're removing this and then trimming this to a shorter tube length. 
it's always best to trim a little bit at a time because if you trim too much, uh, then you would have to use either a tube extender or replace the entire device. But it's good to be able to see this in just the peripheral iris sphincter so that it can be monitored for future occlusion if necessary. Again, we'll trim this tube one more time. Just to shorten it up a little bit. After the tube is placed in the proper location, I'm happy with that. We'll then use additional suture to secure the tube to the sclera. And making sure that it is flat against the sclera. You don't want a lot of excess tube Otherwise it can create more, it can promote friction and, and conjunctival erosion. This is a corneal patch graft that I cut to size. And as you can see, we've placed this into the pocket just for sizing. Then we'll secure the tube with a X stitch or figure of eight stitch. This is using Tenno Vicryl, which I'll be using to secure the pertomy. I think it's fine to use whatever Vicryl you can essentially do the entire case with a 7-0 vicryl suture, a bolt to secure the plate for securing of the tube, for your ligature as well, and to complete your conjunctival closure. I'll advance here just a little bit so you can see the portion that we'll be using for closure. Again, the patch graft is secured just in this little pocket. We have not done too much lateral dissection. Here you can see over here, this is the old bleb from the Zen bleb, which is fairly encapsulated. We'll secure the patch graft with two wing sutures. And then I'll advance here. After the tube is placed, uh, we'll then begin our closure here. And what I'm doing here is just a tack down suture in order to bring this envelope closed. I'll just be using a mattress suture in order to just bring the two layers of tissue closer together for me for the conjunctival running suture. So I'll just advance this through. You'll see I've brought the two layers together in one horizontal mattress suture. And this just allows me to reduce the tension line uh, as we finish our, our uh, running horizontal mattress suture. So this is the first layer closure, which includes conjunctival and tenons. It's not always necessary to do the first layer closure with both layers. You can just secure tenons to tenons first. And after this is completed, um, it allows me to just be able to run the horizontal mattress suture of the conjunctival layer only. And this is the final closure. And then at the conclusion of the case, uh, I'll be injecting beta methasone, which is a long or sh somewhat short acting steroid. It lasts for about two weeks. I know some of you may be concerned about using something like triamcinolone, which may cause a steroid response, but beta methasone gives you about two weeks of good uh, anti-inflammatory control. I do supplement that with topical steroids as well, but I often find that patients need that early control uh, to really reduce injection and, and reduce fibrosis around the plate. Uh, so beta methasone, I inject approximately 0.9 mLs. Here's uh, the 30 gauge needle of beta methasone. And we'll inject that diffusely over the plate uh, site. After this, we'll inject intracameral moxifloxacin and then the case is concluded. So a lot of these steps are reproducible, whether you're doing an Audi, an Ahmed valve or a bear valve. Um, but I wanted to just show you one of my newer techniques in using this clear path where we can use a small envelope conjunctival pyrotomy instead of a large dissection. And I like this technique in the setting of a patient with a prior trabeculectomy scar area. But there's nothing wrong with actually creating a limbal skirt uh, or a limbal based or fornix based opening with a limbal opening with relaxing incisions. And I think for, uh, for, for novice glaucoma drainage device surgeons, 
Exposure is very important. Here I'm working with a fellow of mine, so we're able to help each other for exposure. But if you're working by yourself, I think it's important to make sure that you do an adequate dissection in order to be able to see the rectus muscles and to be able to secure the plate without having to fight the exposure and um, making your view much more difficult. If you can enlarge your perineum, whatever style, whether that be an envelope or whether that be a limbal incision, um, you will have a much better time being able to see the territory where you're securing the plate. And so I think exposure is one key lesson too that I forgot to highlight uh, for novice surgeons, but exposure would be very important uh, to make your life easier, particularly if you're not working with the first assist surgeon along with you. And that's all I have for my talk today. I'm happy to answer any questions for the, the panelists or audience. That was a, just a superbly wonderful uh, video to watch. I'm sure all our speakers and panel would be agreeing on that. I'm going to ask a basic question and I let the expert panel take the tougher ones. What are the risk factors for conjunctival erosion? Conjunctival erosion. I think there was a... a, a uh, Dr. Felix from Mexico City uh, many years ago at, I think, at the American Glaucoma Society meeting, or it might have been World Glaucoma Congress, presented a series of, I think, over a thousand tube shunts and looked at their rates of conjunctival erosion. And it was extremely low, much lower than the published data. I don't know if it was ever published in the literature, but it's been quoted multiple times by uh, multiple people, including Paul Palmberg. But uh, the, the key was to in order to avoid those friction zones that I talked about. When you place a tube with direct entry, maybe just half a millimeter behind the limbus, uh, that creates a bulky area uh, that has high friction. So I think the main thing are tight fissures with lots of friction at the superior limbus. I think that is a, a, a big risk factor for conjunctival erosion. Um, the other risk factors I think would be patients with poor ocular surface. So these patients who have been on glaucoma drops for a long time tend to have poor ocular surface. And if they already have dry eye on top of that or other types of ocular surface disorders, uh, significant lid margin disease, I think those patients are at risk. Uh, in addition, patients, there are some patients with autoimmune uh, conditions or episcleritis. Um, and those patients, I also believe if they have a lot of inflammatory, if there's an inflammatory milieu nearby that also promotes uh, conjunctival retraction um, and breakdown of the closure and breakdown of the tissue over time. So, but I would say that for most patients, the key is, uh, is a mechanical friction in the superior limbal zones. Yes, thank you. Dr. Morley? Uh, Dr. Craig, I have a question for you. You had mentioned that you avoid the area between 10 and two o'clock. Uh, so that leaves very uh, small area if you, uh, up for a superior placement of the plate. So would that mean you enter with the tube at 9 to uh, 10 o'clock if you have a supratemporal, let us say, in the right eye? I mean, you have essentially one clock hour to enter if you avoid the 10 to 2 o'clock position. Yeah, so I, you, 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 try, you try your best. Sometimes the real estate is not enough and adequate enough for you to be able to avoid those areas. But in a, in a virgin eye that has not had any type of surgery, my preference would be if I'm choosing to place a glaucoma drainage device is to route the tube and to place it between the 11 and one o'clock positions, okay? Now, in this case that I showed you on the video, uh, this patient had already prior surgery. And so I had a very small window and I actually moved the tube closer to the 11 o'clock position rather than just go direct entry at the 10 o'clock position. So there was a slight routing of the tube. If you could see that during the video, I tried to really move the tube as superior as possible. Uh, but sometimes you don't have an option. Maybe the tissues have been operated on prior and there's too much cicatricial changes. And so you may have to go at the 10 o'clock position, but the key is to tunnel before entry. The further you can place the tube entry site, the more likely you're going to reduce friction at the limbal zone. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Craig. I think we have a number of speakers uh, get to talk, so we shall move on, but I do hope you stay connected for a while. There was a great learning uh, video for us. Uh, we shall now go on to our next speaker, Dr. Anand Nayak, who's a senior resident in Glockma Cataract and Cornea Services at RP Center. And uh, he's going to be telling us that some uh, very important, uh, not a common complication, uh, supracoroidal hemorrhage. On to you, Doctor. Yes, uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, uh, first of all, I thank uh, AOS team for giving me 
this opportunity among glaucoma legends and and my special thank to my uh, guide and mentor uh, professor tanush dada sir for giving this opportunity and coming to today's topic that uh, supracoroidal hemorrhage is one of the uh, deadliest nightmare complication for ophthalmic surgeons and today we will try to learn how to minimize this complication and preserve good vision and uh, so i will explain uh, this uh, process in parallel with the case scenario uh, which is happened with uh, one of my cases and uh, he is uh, one 15 year old male uh, who, who is uh, diagnosed late onset primary congenital glaucoma at 2 years of age and operated for uh, both eye trabeculotomy and trabeculectomy later he presented with one eye uh, as one eye now his systemic uh, is factor sir he, he was deaf and dumb and unable to follow the commands properly and ocular cyst factors will be like uh, he is already uh, he was previously operated for trab and trab and he, he was highly myopic of minus 8 diopters spherical and uh, high paraoperative iop of 42 mm of ac so now uh, later he planned for uh, retrabeculectomy with 0.4% uh, mitomycin c under explained visual prognosis this is a short clip of uh, retrabeculectomy with mitomycin c Uh, so traction suture applied and uh, fornix based conjunctival peritomy done and uh, thorough cauterization and scleral bed prepared and scleral flap prepared and mitomycin c 0.4% applied and then uh, uh, thorough wash given and anterior chamber paracentesis done and anterior chamber uh, formed with uh, after injecting ai and uh, scleral ostium made and surgical iridectomy perform and then uh, scleral flap closed with uh, tenjuro monofilament nylon on the both the corners and then uh, then the peritomy is closed with tenjuro y creel in a double row fashion and uh, later uh, here in this case one point we lack these uh, uh, we uh, didn't put the releasable sutures so keep in mind uh, that is one learning point uh, from this case after operating and post op day one anterior chamber and blebb uh, are uh, well formed and iop is 12 mm of ag after 5 hours uh, the patient got discharge and he uh, again presented with intense pain in that operated eye on examination flat anterior chamber was there with loss of fundus flow on on ultrasonography see uh, there is choroidal detachment which is uh, kissing in nature and uh, with uh, severe uh, mild to moderate internal reflectivity on uh, a scan and this is the cp of the same eye same operated eye see on uh, examination the one side he got uh, serous choroidal detachment and other other side uh, he got uh, hemorrhagic choroidal uh, and both are kissing each other and this is the opto cp of the same patient and same eye so coming to the risk factors which uh, are responsible for delayed supracoroidal hemorrhage for uh, glaucoma drainage devices are most commonly associated with supracoroidal hemorrhage then the only trabeculectomy and low post operative iop less than 3 mm of ac is the one most common uh, risk factor and aphakic patients and uh, other risk factors will be if i already previously operated and uh, known hypertensive patients ischemic heart disease patients are much more uh, risk for developing supracoroidal hemorrhage and uh, never forget to put releasable sutures in such uh, high risk patients and so if supracoroidal hemorrhage uh, happens in intraoperative period with signs of uh, rise in iop change in uh, red reflex and vitreous prolapse would be there then in such instances uh, you have to prompt closure of the surgical site is mandatory and in case of trabeculectomy closure of the uh, surgical ostium is needed so after that if uh, iop is increased then should be managed with topical and oral iop levering agents if uh, in such cases good visual uh, recovery should be expected and if supracoroidal hem- uh, hemorrhage happens in post operative period uh, with signs of like in this case also intensive pain will be there and change in red reflex a low very low iop and decrease in vision always slit lamp examination and indirect uh, ophthalmoscopy helpful uh, for confirming the diagnosis and ultrasonography always helpful in localizing and marking the extent of supracoroidal hemorrhage and it also helps in assessing the clot uh, lysis during the follow up and uh, with the evidence of uh, decreasing internal reflectivity of the choroidal detachment 
So these are the two ultrasonographic features uh, to differentiate uh, for clotted blood and lysed blood. One is show, uh, the first one is showing with high internal reflectivities uh, in the on USG, which is showing of clotted blood and it is difficult to drain. The other one is showing mild to moderate, uh, very low inter uh, internal reflectivity, suggestive of lysed blood, which is easily uh, drainable supracranial evidence. So for that, surgical approaches will be like uh, once uh, there will be absence of vitro-retinal traction or no retinal attachment, then only external drainage alone is sufficient. And if there is presence of retinal detachment or vitro-retinal traction or vitreous hemorrhage or associated any dislocated lens fragments, then in such instances, vitro-retinal surgery along with external drainage should be needed. So this is the uh, short clip of uh, supracranial drainage of the same patient as explained earlier. So anterior chamber entry made and then uh, anterior chamber uh, maintainer place to maintain the AC fluctuations. And later uh, with 23 gauge procar in an inclined fashion, uh, inserted in the supracoroidal space and we try to drain the supracoroidal fluid. See here the blood is oozing out, hemorrhagic uh, blood from the supracoroidal space and it is uh, as much as uh, uh, the removal fluid is removed and then trocar uh, expel and then the anterior chamber is uh, secured with uh, tenjiro monofilament nylon suture and the AC uh, formed with tensely to Raise the IOP with uh, healer. So on uh, day three post-op, the uh, AC and anterior chamber and blood were very well formed and IOP is 8 mm of AC. Fundal glow improved uh, really well from the day one post-op. And ultrasonography on day one, kissing corals was there and uh, it is uh, after surgery, it improved to single dome-shaped coral detachment. On day five, the dome-shaped uh, coronary detachment was remnant and we planned for re-suturing of the filtering blood. So this is the short video showing re-suturing of the filtering blood. So same patient and uh, we uh, traction suture applied and bleb, filtering blood is explored and the uh, both filtering areas, leaking areas is identified on the, both the sides of the bleb. And then uh, we secured those leaking areas with tenjiro monofilament nylon. And later, the uh, peritomy is closed with 80 uh, white cells. And then uh, we uh, given a uh, uh, little bit of uh, steroids and oral steroids. And on day eight, uh, the fundal glow is really well improved. And on UVSG, only there, there was inferonasal uh, coralloid detachment uh, was there. And uh, later, the patient presented at three months post-op with well-settled coroidals and uh, he got vision of 636 and uh, with IOP of 20 mm of AG and maximal topical medication. And so, uh, so the factors which are associated with surgically poor visual outcomes are supracoidal hemorrhage with retinal detachment and 360 degree supracoidal hemorrhage. Uh, the factors which are with good visual recovery uh, will be like supracroidal hemorrhage without retinal detachment, supracroidal hemorrhage in one or two quadrants, or eyes which underwent surgical procedures for drainage of the supracroidal hemorrhage. So take-home points will be like preoperatively if the patient uh, is high myopic, previously operated, affective patients, and high preoperatively. In such instances, we have to reduce as much as pre-op uh, pre to target range. And hypertension should be controlled and anticoagulants should be stopped. Intraoperatively, we have to keep in mind that ocular compression massages should be given to reduce the IOP and manital should be given to uh, reduce preoperative IOP uh, in a well-controlled manner. During surgery, AC paracentesis is mandatory as to reduce the uh, intraop fluctuations of IOP from high to very low. And pre-placed scleral sutures where uh, suturing the sclera and making the scleral ostium are really helpful to reduce the uh, large range of IOP fluctuations, like very high to very low. And religible sutures are always helpful during surgery and uh, post-operative period also. These are uh, like in our case also, uh, the explained case scenario, uh, lack of religible sutures, uh, we uh, had that supracoronal hemorrhage and uh, Tight scleral flap sutures are always helpful and longer duration of the intraocular surgery and conversion surgeries from take-home medication to 
uh, ECC or SICS and PCR with vitreous loss are always respected for uh, developing supracoronal hemorrhage, weak assays in such instances uh, while managing. And postoperatively, severe hypotony and Valsalva maneuvers are the most important risk factors. And we always uh, have to explain the patient that do not rub the eyes and uh, patching the eyes for at least one week postoperative time as most tricky surgery. Uh, Trabeculectomy is very sensitive surgery, so I have to keep on explaining the patient that do not rub the eyes, night patching for at least one week, and uh, while traveling also he can patch. So uh, these are the uh, take-home notes. Thank you. Dr. Anand, that was an excellent talk. I mean, you, I think you left nothing uncovered. I would uh, uh, ask the expert panel to, you can you stop sharing your screen? Yes, thank you. Yes. I would want the expert panels to discuss this uh, very interesting case. Dr. Shishmita, would you take the questions? Yeah, so uh, one important thing, like Dr. Anand, lovely presentation, a nice detailed uh, story of a very difficult, uh, challenging yeah. patient. So uh, I think one of the uh, important things is to suspect it in top also, because uh, sometimes if you do take care to keep looking at the globe, you might have a change of glow under the microscope and that might give you a clue. But though you said that the patient came back to the ER, but uh, we're not sure whether the supracoroidal really would have started in the post-op period or uh, intraoperatively. The other thing is the feel during surgery. Sometimes you can f feel the eye getting a little firmer and an intraoperative mannitol maybe at that time might help also. But like he said, identifying the risk factors is very, very important. And the small eyes, the really hyperopic eyes when you're doing angle closure, uh, uh, surgery for angle closure, those are the ones which are both for malignant glaucoma as for supraglobality. But otherwise, I thought very well managed. And the most important thing is to wait for clot lysis. You know, as a young surgeon, you might be tempted to achieve supraglobal hair, let's go in and take it out. You have to give that time of about two weeks usually wait for the lysis and only then if it is not settling then decide and i would always prefer a vr surgeon taking over rather than going in as an anterior second those would be my yes dr krishna das would you want to add something here yes dr chitra i think anand demonstrated a well managed patient with their ch but what our younger colleagues those in the audience need to know is how to avoid such a situation because management of these situations are going to be very difficult, especially for anterior segment surgeons, as Sushmita mentioned. And the outcomes are going to be much poorer if uh, uh, conditions like uh, SCH supervene. So the whole crux of the matter is how do we prevent them? How do we identify those eyes at risk, uh, at uh, uh, risk of uh, possible SCH, careful selection of the case, especially advanced glaucomas, and those eyes, uh, like high myopes, fakes, and uh, angle closure glaucoma, which are at a higher risk. And all our efforts should be in preventing either prolonged intraoperative hypotony or uh, postoperative hypotony. All the measures which we take to ensure there is no prolonged hypotony, whether intraoperatively or in the postoperative phase, is going to prevent uh, such a complication. Um, in this context, I don't know whether it's truly in context, but this one question I have is, uh, what is the role of a decompressive vitrectomy in a phacomorphic glaucoma? This has been a, a question in my mind for a long time. There are a lot of cataract surgeons who talk about doing a decompressive vitrectomy in a case of a... So, Chitra, in uh, all our cases where we feel that despite manitol, the pressure is not adequately dropping down. And we have to go ahead and do a cataract surgery. We will definitely, and we are lucky to have the retina surgeons with us. So they will do that for us. And uh, many a times they'll just put in a uh, trocar and then if the vitreous is fluid, it may just come out by itself instead of going in blindly doing a wit. Or maybe they just do a very small core wit and the, the chamber also deepens off and you are operating on a softer eye, which, is, which really is good. Only you want to take a question or shall we go to the next speaker? 
Yeah, I had a question that uh, in yeah. patients with high risk of supracorneal hemorrhage, where we tightly close down the scleral flap, like Sturge-Weber syndrome, or uh, uh, you know that bad angle closure glaucoma, uh, advanced angle closure glaucoma, where you may be doing a fico trap. Uh, so uh, the conjunctiva is likely to scar down. So any of uh, the panel members have any experience using some spacers? Like some people recommend injecting uh, helon over the flap to keep the conjunctiva away from till you remove the releasable suture. So, mostly, I don't think, you know, if you inject helion under the bleb, so after 24 hours, it will all be gone. Yeah, so, yeah. it is not a long-term measure. We don't have here, but in Europe, there is one special HeLa flow implant, which can act as spacer, but that is not available here. So, I don't think helion can be used as spacer. The only important take-home message in this case, I just want to highlight, we had to go back and close the trabeculectomy. Because uh, the vitreoretinal surgeon drained and we were very happy day one and third post of day again kissing choroidal record. So unless you manage the hypotony and you close the trap, your supracordial hemorrhage drainage is not going to work. So that was a learning experience. And what mistake I did in this case was that I should have put in one eyed patient. I should have, it was under general anesthesia. So we should have given mannitol under general anesthesia. Secondly, end of surgery, I should have put some heel on and put additional releasable sutures. But sometimes you are overconfident and the, the case was very nicely formed. And when I saw in the morning, case was 10 pressure doing very well. So you become overconfident. And then one o'clock when I'm having lunch, then casualty call that patient has come back with. So that was great learning experience. So never leave a one-eyed patient high myop in a low IOP state, put some heel on at the end of surgery, put releasable sutures, secure the wound at the end of closure. That is what we learned. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much uh, for those pearls of wisdom. Uh, is Dr. Shanta was there with us? Yes, Dr. Shanta. So we shall now go on to our next speaker, Dr. Shanta, who's a senior consultant in the Department of Glaucoma at Shankar Netralia Chennai. And she is going to tell, be telling us on managing tube exposures, her pearls. Good evening and thank you for inviting me to participate in today's meeting. The topic is management of cornea related complications following tube surgeries. This is a serious complication following the use of glaucoma drainage devices. The rate of endothelial failure has been reported to be as high as 17% to 35%. Rate of tube corneal touch varies from 5% to 23% and corneal graft failure 8% to as high as 46% following the use of drainage devices. The multiple mechanisms involved, which include post-operative shallow anterior chamber, peripheral anterior synecae formation with progressive AC shallowing, tube corneal touch, turbulence at the tip of the tube, tubes placed anterior to Schwalbe's line, and intraocular inflammation. The risk factors for endothelial cell loss have been studied. This is a prospective evaluation of 59 eyes which underwent power belt implantation. The tube was placed in the anterior chamber in 45 eyes and the pass planar in 14 eyes. Endothelial cell loss in the anterior chamber group was 13.1% at one year. There was no cell loss in the pass planar group. The tube corneal angle was negatively correlated with corneal endothelial cell loss. Tube corneal touch may be an issue with intermittent touch with eyelid movement. This was reported in the Asian Journal of Ophthalmology by Dr. Baskar from my institution. You can see the close opposition of the tube with the surface of the cornea. This is a serial visualization of the AGV using ASOCT done in 48 eyes of 48 patients. Serial scans were done from the first post-op day to 12 months. Tube length and angulation from the iris and corneal side were measured. The tube shortened and had a tendency to move towards the cornea. There was an increased tendency in post GVITIC and post PKIs. There are multiple ways that we can reduce the risk of tube corneal touch. Limit the length of the tube in the AC. Place as close to the iris surface as possible. Increase the bevel at the cut end to avoid plugging by iris tissue. Avoid areas of PAS. Position in the serial sulcus or pass planar. And position through an iris hole. This was a patient with extensive PAS, so an hickey guy. So here we positioned the tube through the iris 
However, the bevel was short and iris plucked the opening causing elevated IOP. With iridoplasty, this block was removed and the tube became functional again. Repositioning may be necessary and this can be done through the pass plicator or the pass planar. This was a report on uh, repositioning through the pass planar done in eight eyes, <coughs> nine eyes of eight patients. The indications were progressive anterior chamber shallowing and corneal decompensation, tube corneal erosion. Vision remained stable or improved in seven eyes, and IOP remained under control in all eyes. One patient had a retinal detachment nine months later, which was successfully repaired. So, the pass planar placement requires a good vitrectomy, and once the tube is uh, implanted, the end of the tube has to be carefully visualized, and any vitreous which is entering the tube has to be cut in order to prevent blockage. This is uh, the pass planar insertion of the tube. The entry is made about three millimeters posterior to the limbus. The needle is inserted, 23 gauge. And then the tube is inserted so that it goes behind the plane of the iris and can be visualized. The rest of the procedure remains the same. This is a patient who had the uh, corneal endothelial touch as seen here with the tube very close to the posterior surface of the cornea. Following reposition close to the surface of the iris, you can see that there's a considerable distance from the cornea. This was again a patient with the very close to corneal uh, positioning of the end of the tube. So repositioning here was done through an iris hole. So you can see here that this is well away from the surface of the cornea. Transcameral suture to prevent tube corneal touch was reported. This was done using tenopolypropylene double arm sutures with straight needles. So this uh, was done limbus to limbus and the tube was positioned away from the surface of the cornea. It remained in place for a 20 month follow up but produced significant astigmatism. The approaches for trimming excessive length of the tube include externalizing the tube through an overlying corneal section and trimming it or stabilizing the tube intracamerally using a 30 gauge needle and excising a portion using micro scissors. This is how we most often do it. We use an end gripping, which is forceps, hold the end of the tube and then cut the tube with the scissors, remove the fragment through the paracentesis incision. Sometimes the length of the tube is not sufficient for repositioning, so we may have to use a tube extender. So this is a procedure showing how we uh, use the tube extender. The tube is exposed right up to the edge of the plate. It is trimmed. The extender is connected to the distal portion of the tube. It is anchored to the surface of the sclera using nylon nylon sutures. Following this, the tube is trimmed to a sufficient length and then introduced through the needle track as close to the iris surface as possible. This was a report on GTT malpositioning with two corneal touch in 22 eyes of over 300 patients over a 10 year period. And these are the associated features for corneal decompensation, which include pseudofecupulous cartopathy, uveitis, multiple procedures, and anger closure. So, in conclusion, patient counseling about the possibility of a second procedure, place the tube as close to the iris surface as possible, use a shorter tube length, plan for an appropriate location. Place in the serial circus or pass planar in epicic and surophicic eyes. Look for excessive tube movement and timely intervention to prevent corneal decompensation. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Shanta. That was a, a very thorough talk. Uh, Budli, would you like to take some question? Yeah, I have a question, madam, for um, eye syndrome, especially Chandler's and uh, uh, progressive iris atrophy. What is your initial procedure of choice if they land up with glaucoma? I mean, would you do a trabeculectomy or a pass in a uh, tube? Many of these patients have clear lenses and uh, the corneal endothelial count is like uh, around 500 to 900. Uh, so what would be your initial procedure of choice? Uh, would it be a pass in a tube or uh, uh, would it be a trabeculectomy? We do perform a trabeculectomy if the anterior chamber is fairly well formed and we don't have a peripheral anterior sinicae at the superior limbus. And uh, that works fairly well, but the problem is that the uh, primary pathology is in the endothelium and it can go over the stoma and over a period of time, reduce filtration. So in, uh, 
in case there are extensive peripheral anterior synecae everywhere and it's not possible to create a trephectomy stoma, then we do go ahead with the tube implant. We uh, place uh, the tube in the sulcus. Uh, if it's a fakey guy, if you're able to make an iris uh, hole and then introduce the tube through the hole onto the surface of the iris, that would be better. So these are the techniques that we use when uh, there's uh, eye syndrome. Thank you very much. I paused your time, Murli. We have to move on. Uh, we shall go on to our um, next speaker, uh, Dr. George Putran, who is the Chief of Glaucoma Services. And again, an amazing surgeon from Marvin Kai Care Systems based at Madurai. And I'm sure we can look forward to a lot of learning on his talk on failed uh, glaucoma drainage devices. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Chitra, ma'am. I hope my uh, screen is visible. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, in, uh, in refractory glaucoma following a glaucoma drainage device, if there is an obvious cause, it's easy to treat the cause, like a tube blockage, a tube retraction, or a tenon cyst and bleb encapsulation. But in, in uh, some of the cases, there is no apparent cause, and then it becomes much more difficult. So, coming to the obvious causes, like uh, iris or vitreous blocking the tube. It is highly rewarding if you could surgically remove this material, blocking the tube for better IOP control. Again, for tube uh, retractions, uh, it is, uh, as Dr. Shanda has already mentioned, using uh, surgeons occasionally need to lengthen tubes which have retracted. Also, if there's sufficient length of tube available, you could even recite it as was done in this patient to a different site in the anterior chamber. Or sometimes you might, it might or sometimes be easier to just put in a second tube. For example, this is a retracted tube uh, and then an infronasal uh, repeat tube. Here, another uh, uh, suprotemporal retracted tube and uh, supranasal repeat tube. Uh, this is a significant late complication seen mostly with valve devices, the Ahmed glaucoma valve, where there is progressive thickening of the pleb capsule and increase in trochlear pressure. This particular patient had uh, we excised the capsule beneath the conjunctiva, part of the uh, capsule beneath the conjunctiva three times until it totally scarred down. And finally, we had to place a second tube in the infronasal quadrant. And this was in fact published as a BMJ case report. Now coming to, this is the most difficult part. You have a tube which works for about uh, this particular patient till eight years post-op. You know, this was a patient who had a, a uh, lensectomy, vitrectomy for a uh, uh, micros for microspherophakia and then refractory glaucoma, first tube in the suprotemporal quadrant. Nothing wrong here. And if you look at this is the uh, this is the RD which was placed in the suprotemporal aspect, and it looks like uh, a relatively good diffuse bleb, but with uh, IOPs uh, refractory to maximal medicines. So we plan. This is just a few surgical tips on how to plan a repeat tube. So the important aspect is to have, have a very good exposure. A uh, seven zero silk is what we use. And usually for a supranasal quadrant, if you could place your traction a little towards the temporal side of the cornea and, and clamp it towards the temporal side, uh, temporal side, you can get very good exposure of the supranasal conjunctiva. Uh, Exposure is the key, and uh, I think uh, mentally also you should be prepared, and you should just assume that you're sitting uh, supratemporal and you're doing your. Just forget that the second tube is there, supratemporal. You're doing your first tube, and uh, uh, the, so that is the medial and the lateral rectus, and then the supramid uh, uh, suture goes in, goes into the tube lumen, and uh, the first tie of the. This is the six zero vicral we use. The first tie is over the. Uh, supramid suture, complete watertight closure. Actually, you position yourself slightly uh, supranasal aspect when you, unlike in, uh, when you're doing a supratemporal uh, tube, you sit a little to the temporal aspect here, you sit a little nasal. So the first uh, wing of the RD goes beneath the superior rectus muscle. And then the, uh, the other wing goes uh, beneath the medial rectus uh, So everything, everything is the same as uh, your supratemporal placement, except that you're working in the supranasal quadrant. So the, uh, the RD plate is positioned beneath adjacent rectus muscles, and uh, it is fixed to, the, fixed to the sclera about nine millimeters uh, posterior to the limbus with uh, nine zero nylon uh, sutures. And then the second uh, six zero vicral uh, 
that is uh, ahead of the uh, supramid and then our trademark uh, trademark uh, 23 gauge uh, needle generated scleral tract to uh, to introduce the tube into the anterior chamber uh, we have seen that the 23 gauge the, the needle tract created with through the 23 gauge needle is a uh, very snug fit for uh, all the tubes of uh, glaucoma drainage implants uh, from the different manufacturers and there is a snug fit without any peritubular leakage. It's extremely important to make sure that the anterior chamber doesn't uh, collapse when you withdraw the needle and then a uh, two millimeter uh, was marked, two millimeter, the tube was draped over the cornea, two millimeter mark, uh, it is uh, trimmed and then the tube was threaded uh, into the anterior chamber through this uh, four millimeter scleral tract. We feel that burying the uh, tube in the patient's own sclera is a lot of protection against uh, the dreaded tube exposures, extrusions, and extrusions and uh, related uh, tube-related infections. So that is the second tube in the supranasal quadrant. So this is the post-op picture with tube with the second tube. And uh, coming to some considerations about uh, so management of refractory glaucoma post GDD would involve a repeat tube which is probably the cornerstone of treatment and also cyclophotocalculation, which could be a diode, micro, micropulse, or an endoscopy. There are some major considerations when you plan a repeat tube, whether you are going to choose an armoured glaucoma valve or the non-valved uh, implant and the quadrant of implantation. So this is something which is very important. The anteroposterior diameter of the armoured glaucoma valve is more than the uh, non-valved RD. And it is, uh, it is critical that uh, there is a two millimeter safe zone uh, where the uh, posterior, posterior part of the epistleral plate doesn't impinge on. And so the AGBs might be safest in the suprotemporal and infrotemporal quadrants. Also, uh, this, there is a, a bleb that forms infrotemporally could distort the, distort the lower, eye, lower eyelid. There is a lot of cosmosis involved. The scleral patch that may be kept there uh, might be maximally exposed in the supratemporal quadrant. Again, uh, we used to place a lot of infronasal implants till about four years back, un back until we started analyzing our results with the infronasal implants in both adult and pediatric glaucomas. And to our surprise, we found that though the infrotemporal, infronasal implants were, were working as well as the supratemporal implants in the adult group, in the pediatric group, placement of the RD in the supratemporal quadrant had better IOP related outcomes and is a safer surgical option. The number of tube exposures were more in the infronasal quadrant in the pediatric age group. And uh, so now our preferred uh, go-to quadrant for a repeat tube is the supranasal quadrant and repeat tube as a definite place in the management of uh, select situate in the management of select refractory glaucomas where the primary tube has failed and uh, patient does not respond to maximal medical therapy. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Joy. That was a very challenging case, which you showed. So uh, again, a very basic question. How do you assess a failing uh, tube? You go by the bleb height or the rise IOP or the extent of glaucoma damage? I think it's uh, unlike in, um, in blebs, in uh, trabeculectomy blebs, we don't get much of a clue about, uh, uh, about uh, bleb failure in uh, about the blebs over the epistleral plate of uh, glaucoma drainage devices. Sometimes it's very obvious. It's very obvious, like what we saw in the in the picture, where there is a highly localized ten C or T non cyst there. But in most of the non-valved implants, it is it is nicely low and diffuse, but still with refractory IOP. I think I think the only way to go go ahead with the treatment is to look at the intraocular pressures. Intraocular pressures keep rising with a maximal medical therapy. Probably there is some amount of blood thickening that is happening. You could even do a B scan to see the aqueous reservoir between the plate and the uh, fibrous capsule that forms around the epistleral plate. Again, you can also look at uh, progressive, uh, progressive glaucomatous optic nerve head and visual field loss also. Yeah. Thank you very much. Only I'm going to go on to the next speaker. I'm sure we need to have asked many more questions, but we have to do justice to all our speakers. And thanks a lot, Dr. George. We shall now go on to Dr. Vidya Raja, who's a medical consultant, Glockmer service, Services at Arvind IK Systems, Madurai. And she has another important topic, management of pediatric glaucoma and its uh, sequelae, like cataract related. Thank you, madam. Good evening to all.
after a very careful uh, clear corneal entry as the tissues in these ophthalmic eyes are all stretched and surgical landmarks uh, obscured as it is seen here the anterior chamber is deep the axial length in this uh, child was 26 mm again a challenge in maneuvering and uh, visualization the pupil was non dilating due to post inflammatory synecdoche uh, that formed due to repeated surgical maneuvers in managing the uh, glaucoma uh, the synecdoche was slowly released uh, with the uh, spatula and then the alc is all seen fibrosed uh, in this uh, child it is stained with uh, trypan blue the pupil is stretched very carefully with the uh, coglens and not to disturb the glaucoma drainage device which is seen uh, there usually this uh, in children elastic capsule is seen and the altered uh, landmarks and iris abnormalities make it very difficult to estimate the excess size now the anterior lens capsule is uh, cut uh, slowly with the cystitome after uh, cutting it it is uh, just removed with the capsule forces uh, forceps with enough uh, cut with the vanas the iop in this child uh, was maintained well post uh, glaucoma drainage uh, surgery the corneal diameter when she presented to us was 15 mm uh, primary congenital glaucoma in uh, may have to undergo these children have to undergo multiple time surgical procedures to control the intraocular uh, pressure as it happened in this child which delayed her uh, cataract surgery and which is a well known uh, uh, complication the cataract as it is seen is very soft and adherent to the posterior capsule it is very gently and slowly aspirated with uh, sumco cannula and uh, not to use an ultrasonic uh, phaco as at this stage uh, again we anticipate uh, zonular uh, dehiscence and uh, laxity due to the enlargement of the ciliary body ring which is due to the rapid growth of the eyeball and the stretching because of the fluctuations in the intraocular pressure in this in, in children the cortex is uh, slowly aspirated completely Uh, the peripheral cortex is also made sure it is uh, completely aspirated as uh, that can proliferate and cause a rise in uh, intraocular pressure again worsening the glaucomatous uh, damage enough capsular support is made sure the capsular bag is usually larger in larger than normal in these eyes to accommodate the normal standard uh, eye wells in hence i will <clears throat> decentrations can occur and i will can even be seen floating uh, in this extra large bag leading to lot of refractive uh, surprises post operatively as these children are also sensitive to uh, small eye well fluctuations also the cortex is made sure it is completely uh, removed you can see the central breadcrumb uh, pco now very clearly there are many eye wall options available capsular implantation the anterior optic capture customized lenses or uh, eye wall uh, suturing techniques ideally we prefer to place an uh, three piece acrylic hydrophobic lens which uh, we did in this uh, child uh, gently it is injected many studies recommend uh, rexus fixation of the lens to prevent decentration where the optic is captured and uh, the haptics are uh, sulcus placed the eye well is carefully injected into the bag and uh, the haptic is made sure is uh, completely dialed into the bag after stretching the bag enough with the uh, visco elastic the optic is well centered now pco is clearly visible ppc is attempted with the cystitome since there was already a delay in visual rehab due to glaucoma management and ppc is done in this child 
uh, aiming at better optical uh, correction and uh, amblyopia management. Um, in spite of all our efforts, uh, post-operatively at uh, one month, uh, the eye will uh, decentered in this uh, child. And uh, we had to refixate one nasal uh, haptic to the iris so that the optic was uh, centered in the visual axis. And uh, usually all the ports are closed in children. Entries are closed to prevent uh, inflammation and uh, uh, IOP spikes, which can again uh, cause a lot of uh, glaucomatous uh, progression. Uh, though we maintained her IOP and uh, the lens was in the visual axis later, we could not restore her uh, vision because of uh, progression to glaucomatous optic atrophy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Vidya. But going on to the cataract part of it, you did mention that there was some zonular weakness. So you could have thought of putting a CTR or you could have done an optic capture with the haptic in the sulcus. Why is it... Yes. Uh, you allowed that uh, expect you, you in your talk you expected decentration to occur. So why did you not do these preventive measures in the first step? Uh, when we did the surgery at uh, uh, post op day one, uh, the eye was well centered. Uh, so we maybe we should have anticipated. We anticipated this, but uh, at day one it was centered. Only at the one month post op we could see this uh, decentration. Okay. Maybe that is expected in uh, all these uh, uh, glaucomatous eyes. Yeah. yeah. Anybody uh, expert uh, opinion from any of the experts in the panel? Uh, Dr. Morley, can I ask you one question? Yes. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, how? What is the role of customizing the intraocular lenses? Yeah, if you have to customize the uh, intraocular lenses, you need to know the back diameter first, madam. Uh, so to check on the back diameter, we need to do UBM. And uh, having a preoperative uh, UBM uh, where the capsular back diameter fit is more than 10 and a half uh, millimeter, maybe there is a role in uh, customizing, madam. Okay. Customizing, I think we have a number of Indian companies that do it. I have not done experience with this. I have also done in a bifthalmus, but in that case, the back diameter was quite okay. I avoided a PPC because a group from Chandigarh had reported that doing a PPC almost results in 100%. Yes, yes, yes. But so we had to do in this child because... Uh, plaque was already, Yeah. Plaque yeah. was done. But uh, for customization, yes. we need to measure the back diameter. Back madam, diameter. Okay. be done by UBM. Okay. I have very less experience. Yeah. That was a lovely presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Thank uh, you. I'll now go on to our next speaker, Dr. Mulida Ramapa, who is a, a, a senior consultant in the cornea department from LB Prasad uh, Institute, Hyderabad. And, and he is going to be telling us about management of uh, pediatric glaucoma in the cornea perspective. Good evening, madam. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, you can see my slides. Yes. Yeah, I've been asked to you know, speak on a management of cloudy cornea, particularly in a bupthalmic eye. Do not have any financial interest. As we know, primary congenital glaucoma is a very rare ophthalmic condition in the Western population. And it seems to be nearly three to five times much higher in our uh, Indian subcontinent and also much aggressive course. They tend to have a lot of collateral damage in the form of corneal decompensation. They're mostly bilateral. So <clears throat> neonatal seems to be, you know, having a very aggressive course. And these are the subset of cases where they may end up having a persistent corneal edema, which may need some form of a corneal interventions. Although one of the most commonest manifestation being the epithelial edema early on, in a cases where we do not intervene them, Eventually, it can lead to persistent corneal edema and leading on to the corneal scarring and permanent, uh, you know, sequelae, including irregular astigmatism if we have uh, something like a hapstraye. Although hapstraye <clears throat> seen in a small subset, it is a sudden onset in corneal edema due to split in the desmid's membrane. And mostly once we take care of uh, intraocular pressure, you know, they tend to resolve. 
However, you know, since, you know, the hap stray comes in a different size, shape, and a location, it can have a significant astigmatism. So this has to be taken care in order to minimize the embolopia. The various, you know, interconnecting factors, you know, apart from corneal edema, which may contribute to the poor, uh, you know, the functional outcome in these children. This was an young child who was uh, around two months at the time of presentation, could see a distorted uh, eye with the scleral stretching. Intraocular pressure was close to 60 millimeter under general anesthesia. And uh, we, we, we did a UBM and exclude all other possible causes and did a trap and waited nearly, you know, three months time to give enough time to cornea to settle down. So if you look at, you know, PK in these conditions are extremely challenging. The fact that, you know, you have a distorted uh, anterior segment anatomy, uh, reduced rigidity, which, which in turn actually increases the all intraoperative technical challenges. Okay. Because the cornea and entire eye is a pliable, more elastic, uh, that also has a you know risk of having a lens or a expulsion or even expulsive suprachoroidal hemorrhages. So I like to spend few more seconds here. It's always important to have a hypotensive anesthesia in these cases, and if possible, we can give a minimal retrobulb bar block, give a super pinky, and also we can set a child under a head and elevated. We could also plan, you know, bolus dose of mannitol in these children. They generally well tolerate and, uh, you know, try use a retracting eyelid sutures over the speculum. Speculum, you know, tend to impinge on a globe, rise the intraocular pressure. So is all, you know, technical difficulty. I like to avoid flaring a right ring, particularly in the setting, you know, moving to one is, you know, I may be damaging the subconjunctival space. Second thing, you know, because the sclera is much thinner here, you have a risk of having a perforation. And also we need to slowly decompress when, as we enter into the anterior chamber. So as my surgical video will explain, I will skip in interest of uh, time. So this is a surgical video demonstrating, this is a case of primary congenital glaucoma. Possibly aniridia, where uh, both parents had aniridia. I like to do a near 80% thickness trephination here. So I've not entered anterior chamber, carrying out a blunt dissection and debulking nearly 80% of the stroma. At this stage, you know, I you know try to you know debulk and decompress slowly. By then, you know, my manitol would have kicked in. And these are eyes are much higher, you know, if you look at, you know, horizontal corneal diameter was around 14 millimeter in this case, I tend to do a little larger graft. This was a 8.5 millimeter at refined size and leave behind a very thin sliver uh, posterior ledge that helps in a, you know, good watertight secure and also, you know, <clears throat> minimize the risk of inadvent inadvertent injury to the lens or iris. So this is at the end of the surgery. So you can see in a post-operative day one. And one of the most uh, key parameters in the second, you know, well, you know, intraocular pressure is controlled post-operatively. This is the same, same child. And he has completed uh, eight long years. We have a little over, you know, 50 children where they have uh, completed uh, 10 years follow up doing exceedingly well and uh, this is one of the important case i just want to bring in an example if you look at the asymmetrical nature of this disease the left eye obviously you know did not clear after a trap and the right eye has a milder disease to my surprise i just scrape up the you know epithelium i just saw some kind of a deposits on a corneal endothelium and what I did is that, you know, I, I felt, you know, the peripheral endothelium was intact. Peripheral cornea, in fact, is much clear. You don't see a half stray here. There is no desmid split. I thought of, you know, just scraping up this abnormal anomalous endothelium. Let's see what happens. So I just try to avoid, you know, wherever possible, you know, penetrating keratoplasty. There are certain cases I also do a selective optical iridectomy. If you put at three months, and we do have a picture at one year, it is completely clear where we could actually avoid doing a transplantations. 
So while you know I've showed some of the good example, best case scenario, our 10 year graph survival is well over 51%. But considering many issues, considering the longevity of these children, they invariably end up you know having either rejection, cataract formation, and uh, repeat surgery for a glaucoma or a cataract that again you know put the graft into failure. These are some of the complex cases where a fourth graft under immunosuppression, EFA kick with a tube in place, doing good, I'm crossing my fingers, one-eyed patient. And there are certain cases, you know, you have a corneal infections, uh, multiple grafts, and eventually they, some cases, you know, end up succumb to, you know, crisis by particularly, you know, Adi implant. Uh, because, you know, the over draining, I don't know what happens in those cases. Some of these cases do not do well. I just want you to focus only the underlying, uh, you know, the lines. So this is based on a single surgeon, you know, Dr. Anil Mandal. About 12% of his cases needed uh, some form of a corneal transplantation. Either it may be a DSEC or a PK. And if you look in terms of postoperatively, what are the risk factor for the failure is the uncontrolled intraocular pressure being the top one. The second being the, of course, you know, rejection third being the infection in our setting. So we did about, you know, 91 children, you know, the, which had completed nearly uh, 10 year follow up. Uh, this was a study spanned about, you know, 31 years and nearly, you know, 51% of them had a clear anatomical outcome at the end of 10 years. And uh, following a second graft, you know, the risk is further increases. You know, if you look at, you know, their survival actually dips. 0.8 and a third and fourth tend to have a much lower you know survival rate so although you know this can produce a long-term modest outcome but our series showed extremely good outcome in comparison to the western data <clears throat> in conclusion pk offers a very long uh, decent outcome in these cases provided you know iop is well controlled and seems to non-immunogenic uh, region seems to be one of the important risk factor. Perhaps, you know, if we look at following a TRAB or a, you know, uh, anti-glaucoma drainage device, the anterior chamber inflammation, the turbidity has been found to be, you know, this is, this, this is one of the important risk for, uh, you know, the endothelial decompensation, even in absence of a rejection here. And what is very important is it's not just clearing the visual axis. We may have to take care uh, appropriately, you know, refractive error. So it's an ambulopia. And most important key parameter would be, you know, controlling how robustly we control intraocular pressure. Although IOP measurement can confirm uh, in, in a post keratoplasty eyes, it's very, very important to look at surrogate measures like, uh, you know, the myopic shape expanding corneal diameter, axial length, and of course, wherever in a, you know, children who are cooperative, where it is applicable, so the visual field assessment may play an important role and also helping give them, you know, long-term quality of life to these children. Thank you for your kind attention. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Uh, <clears throat> how do you measure IOP in your patients following Surgery. Oh, extremely good question, ma'am. You know, what I do is, you know, I determine the astigmatism and I set the, you know, if the child is cooperative, you know, the red mark to the, you know, the steep meridian and take the intraocular pressure. Or if we are unable to pick up that, you know, the astigmatic axis, you know, on a two meridians, you know, we go and measure and take an average. So I care, you know, typically it overestimate. And a GAT seems to be one of the very reliable. In a non-cooperative children's, we use a Perkins intraoperatively. We may have to, you know, force to put this child under anesthesia. Yeah, it's very tricky. So we may, we never get a accurate intraocular pressure. The reason is other biggest confounder, we use a sevoflurin in our setting that also actually induces some degree of hypotony. So we may underestimate the intraocular pressure. Yeah, the looking at surrogate measure, including the myopic shift, uh, axial measurement, and white to white diameter, they play an important role, ma'am. Murli, would you like to take a question? 
Uh, yes, madam. Uh, uh, Rakh I wanted to ask you. Uh, in one of the videos that you showed, you remove remove the diseased uh, decimates and then the cornea cleared up. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. True. Okay. And in these patients, do you just uh, make do with topical steroids, or would you add some systemic immunosuppression when you have a penetrating keratoplasty in place, especially for the very young, like one to two years? Would you uh, do systemic immunosuppression or just make do with topical yeah, steroids? Great, great question, uh, Dr. Morley. Yes. So if it is the second which is graft, okay. if the whole spit has a lot of vessels, high risk factors, certainly, you know, we may have to put them on immunosuppressions. So what I do is uh, I typically use a cyclosporin. Most children, you know, tolerate very well. You just need to rule out, you know, if they have any renal abnormality or a contraindication. Uh, so I start as an intense, you know, that is a four milligrams per kg body weight in the initial, you know, six months until, you know, my sutures are all out. Then I go down to two milligrams per kg body weight for the next, you know, 12 to 18 months. Then take a decision to, you know, discontinue because, you know, you may not be able to use it for a long time. So whenever if they have a more than one trap, second PK, and if they have any valve, so I think those cases, we have to put them on immunosuppression. Otherwise, those grafts will not last. Thank you very much, Dr. Murli. Thanks for being here with us today. Thank you, uh, Yeah. We shall now go on to our next speaker, Dr. Uh, Sushmita Kaushik, who's a professor from the Department of Ophthalmology, PGI Chandigarh. And again, an amazing surgeon with a unlimited the knowledge on glaucoma. So let's learn from her. Thank you so much, Dr. Chitra, for having me on this amazing uh, webinar. Lots, lots to learn. Thank you. So um, going on to those uh, children who've had pediatric cataract surgery and then uh, land up with us for glaucoma. So I like this quote a lot. There are no seven wonders of the world in the eyes of the child. There are seven million. So the children, for them, really, the world is there for them to see. And if we don't catch them early, uh, in uh, in time, then we may be in trouble. So uh, the, the caveats for glaucoma following pediatric cataract surgery, I feel, is to anticipate or suspect. Unfortunately, they come to us way too late. So anticipate and suspect and then diagnose and then treat. I think that's the caveat that we would use. So who do you anticipate and suspect it? The high risk ones are the children with smaller eyes, less than 16.5 millimeters at birth. If the age of surgery is less than six months, if you're doing bilateral surgery simultaneously, for some reason, the use of tripan blue, I mean, that was interesting when I went through the literature, re-interventions make sense. And I will, of course, because you're putting so much of hardware into a small eye. Um, Coexisting cataract with glaucoma is uncommon, but I'd like to say that it's not uh, impossible. So these are uh, diseases to keep in mind, especially for our setting, coexisting rubella, because infection is important. And Lois syndrome is known, but it's not particularly common. So once it happens, there should be no complacency. It's not going to go away. So for in the instance, in this case, if you thought that this cornea was equal to this cornea, it's not going to happen. So iatrogenic glaucoma, something that we've given the kid and the child didn't have it to start with. And remember, once we've given it to the child, that baby or that, uh, that kid has to deal with it for the rest of his life. So in a nutshell, the management could be medical or surgery. Of course, we start with medical management. But unfortunately, if it's not looked for, by the time the children come to us, it's it's quite a bit uh, advanced. Surgery always depends on intraocular pressure and disc damage. You would like to do angle surgery first because secondary glaucomas tend to do all right. I think because the outflow channels are okay to begin with and it's a trabecular meshwork problem. But having said that, trabeculectomy, glaucoma drainage devices, and even a limited diode laser cyclophotocoagulation Maybe you could include an ECP if you have your machine there into that. So these are the angle surgeries that we have, a coniotomy, a bang or a gat. Always be alert. For instance, this father was a faking and the minute he had the baby daughter, he took it to the ophthalmologist. She was detected early, infantile surgery done at six months, but then presented to us at eight years of age. So 
we have no idea what has happened between six months and eight years. She comes to us pseudo faking, uh, the right eye PCO, left eye obviously Gophthalmos. You can see the larger eye in the left. IOP was 17 and 28 millimeters of mercury. So remember in small children, the eye may just enlarge in response to pressures without there being appreciably steamy cornea or any other signs. And this is what the discs were like. So through the PCO, we could see the right eye hazily, but you can see that the left eye already for this child has had quite a bit of damage. So that's what I meant that by the time they come to us, they are already quite late. So we decided on angle surgery because it was a reasonable cornea. We thought the trabecular meshwork were dysfunctional. And though there was peripheral anterior sinecae, we decided on the least invasive root cause. So remember these children, like Dr. Moodley said, have to live long. And as far as possible, if we could avoid opening the conjunctiva, I'd be happy. So you can see these bits of PA is there, but otherwise the, the TM through the hazy cornea, slightly hazy cornea was reasonable. So with surgery, we tried GAT, but uh, you can see this is the peripheral anterior sinecae. That since this, this is the nasal angle that's being seen. Um, so there is PAS there, but we managed with the with the small goniotomy, and we don't have the eye track at least commercially available in India. So we do use a fibroproline to do a, a GAT, and the idea is to treat as much of the trabecular meshwork as possible in one time. So that was the idea that we'll take it as it comes. And uh, as we kept advancing it, you saw the suture, we saw that it getting stuck. So we decided to, you know, uh, remove the lens and just do a hemigat or do as much of the TM as possible. And the next thing we thought was let's treat the rest of the angle with a bang. So this is just a 25 gauge needle that we use. You bend the tip of it and the rest of the angle. So even if you can't do a full gat, at least do as much as possible. And the rest of the angle as much as possible so you rather than do just about 120 degrees with the goniotomy you can manage almost 270 degrees in most of these eyes and she did very well with this um when we're coming to a glaucoma drainage device so this was a child who was pseudo fake had quite a bit of glaucoma had a couple of surgeries so this is easy we usually implant into the sulcus i'm, I'm running both videos together so this is the tube which will go straight so the idea is keeping a slightly longer tube so that you can see the tube post-operatively and uh, once you can see it post-operatively that's important so you just put that there and here you see the tube just under the iris so it's easy to monitor so uh, it's an easy thing to do when the child is uh, pseudo faking and here you can see this is the ridge of the uh, non valve drainage device. We have the oral lab drainage device here with, of course, a tight suture. So this was one of the things when we were talking about what do we do with the blebs. Um, this is one way to monitor when the ligator is going to be released. And we are very careful in removing AGMs at that time when this border starts to get fuzzy. So that's just one small tip in whenever we put a drainage device. So sometimes uh, these children are a faking and uh, you choose the parts planar and you think the child is vitrectomized and you just just do that so this this we learned the hard way uh, first post-op day and you can see all these vitreous stands going into it so we made the mistake of thinking that it's a vitrectomized child and we didn't do a skirt vitrectomy before implanting it in the parts planar so we had to take it up this is the very next day you can see the sutures there and as we did the vitrectomy we realized how silly we were and this is the inferior nasal tube and you can see how much of vitreous there was so it takes time but take your time and do as much of vitrectomy and do as much of the anterior vitrectomy so even if you have a vitrectomized eye a post uh, post uh, ppvi remember the skirt vitrectomy needs to be done by us and these are the pictures after that you can see how clear the tube is and now that's how the pressure was controlled so it's important to see why the pressure is rising and what to do with it now often these Children have had multiple surgeries. This is someone with a congenital, uh, sorry, a traumatic cataract who had multiple surgeries, had a PPD for an RD as well, and then came to us with very high pressures. Sometimes you have syndromic children who you know are not going to show you, and you think that it's better to be non invasive. The ciliary body area is distorted, the vision is not too great. So it may be one reason for the unpredictability of DLCP. So what we started doing is 
use a simple pen torch to delineate the ciliary body. And this is a short video to just show how it's done. Um, so the microscope lights are switched off. Usually the microscope isn't used, but this is the small pen torch and you can see how far back the ciliary uh, body actually is. So the limbus is really distorted. And one reason why we see the, the results are so unpredictable is I think maybe sometimes we don't even treat the ciliary body, we're treating too anteriorly. And uh, we use a sterile gentian violet marker to mark out the area which has been shown. We usually leave the supernasal area untreated all the time. So that has uh, helped provide. So you can see where the ciliary body starts. And then we do the DLCP by putting the anterior plate where we have marked it rather than at the limbus. And this has given us much more predictable results, especially in children and those with very, very distorted limbus system. This is one small inexpensive hack that we've had and we're happy with that. So in a nutshell, glaucoma after pediatric surgery may compromise an otherwise excellent outcome. So intraocular pressure measurement is mandatory after a cataract surgery and look out for intraocular pressure Excellent growth. That has helped very much, especially in children up to three years of age and the disc appearance because the IOP may be fallacious. Early ocular hypertension must be promptly treated medically before the disc becomes damaged. But once there's disc damage or there's bophthalmos, we've realized that usually they require surgery. And I'd like to thank all my team and my residents who work painstakingly hard every day. Thank you very much for having me. That was an amazing talk. Fantastic, Doctor. Uh, Murli, would you have any questions? Do we have our last speaker, Dr. Venkatesh, with us? No? Oh, he's there. Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Venkatesh. Murli, would you take a question or shall we go on to Dr. Uh, yeah, Madam. It is said, uh, Madam, that uh, glaucoma is usually bimodal in onset in these uh, children. Uh, like in the initial first year after surgery, they have an angry flosher uh, disease and later on, whatever glaucoma develops, it is uh, uh, an open angle, the second peak at five years. So is that correct, madam? How often do you see that bimodal onset in your practice? So usually, at least nowadays with the microsurgical techniques and uh, fantastic cataract surgeons that are there, early post-op IOP is less commonly seen. But just because the pressures are okay for the first year or two is not a reason to forget about these children. And that's why they come to us late, eight years, nine years later, when already this damage is done. And I think this amount of creeping angle closure does play a role which comes on later. So like congenital glaucoma, I think congenital cataract, the children must be told that this is a lifelong disease and you'll never be rid of us. So even twice a year, pressure recordings and everything else, as along with the visual rehabilitation, amplia, they do keep coming. But sadly, the intraocular pressure measurement does get forgotten in, in all that. So I, I would say that. Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Shushmita. So we shall now go on to our last speaker, uh, Dr. Venkatesh, who is a Chief Medical Officer and Chief of Glaucoma Services at Uh, are you muted? Oh, no, madam. So you can start, sir. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you for having me. And uh, we'll, we'll try to finish in another six minutes now. Gateway to safe cat. Gonioscopy assisted. Transluminal trabeculotomy. Or cat. The brainchild of Dr. Davinder Grover and Dr. Ronald from Glaucoma Associates of Texas, Dallas. Dr. Venkatesh, you're not seeing this screen. You're not seeing? Okay, let me try again. Can you see now? Perfect, sir. You can continue, please. Yeah. It's an ab internal canalization of Schlem's canal to you're create 360 it. degrees of trabeculotomy. Conventionally done with an illuminated microcatheter, the low-cost option is by using 5-0 proline suture. Here are the must-have items for performing suture GAT. 5-0 proline suture, low-temperature cautery, direct Swan-Jacob gonio lens, 
high viscosity ophthalmic viscosurgical device OVD like Helon GV or Orogel 25 gauge MVR blade MST forceps indirect gonioprism McPherson's forceps An ideal suture gap surgery involves the blunting of the tip of the 50 proline suture using a low temperature cautery to make small flange at the tip Following this the suture is introduced into the anterior chamber under OVD A small one clock hour initial goniotomy is made in the trabecular meshwork using the 25 gauge MVR blade then the flange suture tip is introduced into the Schlems canal using MST forceps under Swan Jacob gonio lens visualization with gentle strokes the proline suture is advanced gently into the canal till it appears from the opposite side where it is grasped at the tip above the initial suture and brought to the center of the anterior chamber finally using a mcpherson's forceps the external suture is pulled out creating a 360 degrees ab antero trabeculotomy we share here some beginners complications and we will also focus on some tips and tricks to avoid them positioning and seeing the angle initially during intraoperative gonioscopy one will have air bubbles or too much pressure which can result in indentation and failure to see the angle properly but with practice one can master this skill a thorough preoperative slit lamp gonioscopy with special attention to the nasal angle is very important initial intraoperative gonioscopy can be practiced on routine cataract cases before initiating or after completing the case tilt the patient's head 30 to 35 degrees away from you and tilt the microscope 30 to 35 degrees towards you put a drop of ovd on top of the cornea and gently place the swan jacob gonio lens over this drop adjust the microscope magnification start from a lower magnification and then slowly zoom up using the microscope foot switch routinely practice the foot switch of the operating microscope as both the hands get engaged while doing mix so finer adjustments need to be done using the microscope foot switch ideal flange the tip of the 50 proline is blunted to form a small flange using low temperature cautery this is to make the tip atraumatic and facilitate its smooth passage in the schlems canal tip keep the low temperature cautery a little away from the tip to get a just needed flange If cautery comes in contact with the suture, the flange is too big for the size of the canal. It will result in difficult entry into the canal and may also create a false passage. Tip to avoid false passage. In addition to a perfect flange tip, there is another way to ensure that the suture is in the canal and has not taken any other path. This is to perform an indirect gonioscopy on table using a sterile single mirror gonioprism. The blue color of proline helps in identifying its presence behind the trabecular meshwork that is in Schlems canal. This will also give an idea as to how many clock hours have been traversed and how many clock hours are left. Direction of the tip should be circumferential rather than perpendicular to the goniotomy. What happens if a false passage is created inadvertently? The suture tip can go into the supracoroidal space and cause a choroidal detachment. which can be managed conservatively with oral and topical steroids and resolve within 15 days reduce bleeding from conjunctiva and schlems canal make the incision on the clear cornea to avoid any bleed from conjunctival vessels as this can result in poor visualization and there are a few tips to avoid reflex bleeding from schlems canal while making the initial tear in trabecular meshwork Keep the patient's head above the heart level by lifting the head end of the operating table. Fill the anterior chamber with high viscosity OVD like Helon GV or Orogel. Partial or semi gat. As the proline passes through the Schlems canal, resistance is experienced when it reaches 180 degrees as it has to turn the other side. It is an indirect sign that the suture has reached 180 degrees, but sometimes it doesn't proceed beyond this point. tip in the situation try twin side gat which means threading the suture in clockwise direction rather than the initial anti clockwise direction leave it at the site of resistance try to localize the suture using indirect gonioscopy on table if the suture has reached 270 degrees then try to make a small nick at that site and retrieve the suture 
By implementing these tips into routine practice while performing GAT, one can achieve desirable results. It requires practice and perseverance to master suture GAT, but these tips can ensure a safe gateway to successful GAT. Thank you. Wonderful presentation, Dr. Vankesh. Your videos are always uh, truly amazing. Thank uh, you, madam. We thought, we thought we'll, we'll share the tips and tricks so yes, that really all, nice. more than the complications, it's uh, yes. people yes. can be benefited. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Murli, can you take a question before we conclude? Yeah, uh, sir. How significant is the epistleral uh, fluid venous wave uh, in predicting success of uh, GAT, sir? Like in, uh, like in trabeculectomy, you have so many adjustments you can do in the post-operative period. But in GAT, there is nothing. You just have to wait and uh, hope that the pressure uh, uh, falls. Just in case the pressure fails to drop, how long can you wait before uh, recommending either additional medical therapy or further surgery? Um, I think it's again a matter of time only. The, during the post-operative period, no? at least two to three months period, it usually stabilizes with your steroid response. Sometimes you get micro hyphemas, which can again raise the pressure. So you'll have to wait and watch. Maybe in between, you may need anti glaucoma medications also. But to see a good effect, it, it minimum it takes uh, 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 four to six weeks, you know, and then uh, you can really assess. And after a certain time, definitely after three months, you'll know whether it's really working or not. Yes. Anything else from the expert panel before I conclude? I think you all can switch on the screen before when I can have a proper look at all of you and uh, express my most heartfelt thanks for the wonderful webinar, which you we thought, but it got created by only each and every one of you. It wouldn't have been anything better if each of you had not delivered such a wonderful series of talk and thanks so much to the expert panel. I know I could ask any question and I would get the bang on the, just the answers which I need. I think we should have utilized Dr. Craig's uh, contributions a lot more, but I think we were running out of time. Thank you so much, Dr. Craig, for you being there. Dr. Harsh, Dr. Shushmita, Dr. George, Dr. Venkatesh, um, Dr. Vidya, Dr. Devang, and Dr. Sati, and Dr. Ronnie George, each and every one of you. Thank you so much. Thanks to my ARC uh, colleagues who are always there to support me. And it goes without saying, I really need to thank my mod co-moderator Murli, who's such a solid uh, block of support for me at all times and uh, helped me wade through this uh, tenure of ARC with a lot of support from him. And uh, I need to thank my AOS admin, uh, Mr. Kripal and all his team. Need to thank Sai, who always uh, fills up your inbox. I do hope you all always remember me only with a smile and not as a person who sent so many mailers to all of you. And uh, I definitely, definitely need to uh, thank um, Mr. Sunil, as you can see how uh, brilliant and efficient he is in ensuring that the webinar runs uh, very, very smoothly. And believe me, we really owe our thanks to Entoad. They have been such a phenomenal support for all our ARC webinars. And I was talking about physical meetings to add on. They said they are always there for us. So, you know, that sort of encourages me to think unidirectionally towards academics and not overly worry about how I would go about uh, getting the sponsorship. Even CIPLA has come forward to help me in my few of my physical meetings. But I do hope that you all believe as I believe that a lot of learning comes through the webinars. I just wanted to ask you all whether you all feel as similar to me or you all feel that it's only the physical meetings are the way to go. No comments? <laughs> tough, tough, tough question, madam. We should know on the other side how many people are seeing, you know, because yeah. some of, sometimes most of the speakers, they don't know. You know, actually, because yeah. you are in no, touch with I, the admin. No. Yeah, no, no. It was something like early days, 1,800, 1,500, then 800 and all. But nowadays it is 400, 500 and all that. And uh, so, you know, I think, and more importantly, it's on that day, but over the days, you know, I would actually share with this group over the days and the months, the kind of people opening and uh, viewing some of the important topics and their needed topics is a truly very, very heartening. So I think uh, it has its role now. I think it was COVID's blessing besides it all. Anyway, thank you so much. Thank, Thank you very you. much for a wonderful webinar.
थैंक यू थैंक यू मैडम थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक यू